This episode of the Tony Robbins podcast is brought to you by Tony Robbins Results Coaching. Are you ready to experience an extraordinary quality of life? Or maybe you're already doing well, but you know you can take your life to a whole new level. To do that, you have to set yourself up to win. You need a process, a way to consistently grow and produce the results that you need. That's what a Tony Robbins Results Coach can do for you. Whatever area in your life you want to change, your relationship, your health, your career, your business, coaching is one of the most valuable tools you can have. It's an investment in yourself, and it can yield some of the highest returns. Tony Robbins Results Coaches are hand-selected and trained by the master of coaching, Tony Robbins himself, to have the skills that will empower you with supreme focus, powerful insight, and the accountability needed to achieve everything you've ever dreamed. To help you get started, Tony is offering podcast listeners a free results coaching strategy session with one of his top coaches. It's a $200 value, and you're getting it for free. Visit TonyRobbins.com slash results. Schedule that free session today. Welcome to the Tony Robbins Podcast. In this special mini season, we are unlocking the vaults to bring you exclusive, in-depth conversations between Tony and four truly outstanding achievers and impressive innovators. These individuals are not just experts in their respective fields who can speak to any facet or dynamic of the subject. They are pioneers. They are charting new territory and breaking new ground. Their insights, ideas, and drive that are shaping the world that we live in. And hopefully, they will also enlighten and invigorate you in some real way so that you too are inspired to think outside the box and take some real action. So without further ado, let's get into the first episode. We are excited to bring you a conversation Tony had with the marketing savant, Jay Abraham. Jay has served as the consultant to some of the greatest entrepreneurs of all time and has assisted over 10,000 companies from more than 400 different industries around the world. Wildly recognized as the Billion Dollar Man, Jay has also been recognized by Forbes magazine as one of the top five executive coaches in the country. Jay has made his mark as a legendary marketing guru who knows what it takes to become the leader and most trusted source in your market. I think you're going to especially enjoy this session, and I think for a lot of reasons. Number one, the person you're going to have a chance to visit with, along with myself, is a very, very special man. He's brilliant, and brilliant in an area that I think can really make a difference in your life, no matter how successful you already are, and that is the area called marketing. Now, you might say, well, why would I want to know about marketing? You know, I'm not, you know, a salesperson. I'm not running that portion of my business, or I'm not part of a business that does that. Well, first of all, all businesses are about marketing. In today's society, where things are so competitive, very often someone having a better product does not mean that they're going to have a better income or that they're going to have a person who's the best at a job is going to keep that job. We're living in a society right now, as you and I both know, where there's downsizing going on, where companies are going out of business very rapidly, and where doing the best job does not guarantee you a sense of certainty about your future. And many people are finding that what they were trained for for years is disappearing. So I think a talk that doesn't just inspire you, but really gives you some fundamental tools on how you can take control, how you can create a competitive edge for yourself, how to market yourself, or how to take the business you own, if you own one, and market it more effectively, is one that is extremely timely, and one that I think can make a difference in your life. The secret, of course, for me was, okay, if I'm gonna do this subject, I could talk about this, or I could bring someone in who I have tremendous respect for, who I think is one of the best in the world in this area, and I chose to do that. And we're gonna get a chance then to visit with a man by the name of Jay Abraham. And Jay is a phenomenal human being. He's quite articulate. In fact, he may use language that will leave some of us in the dust. I'll have to make sure if he uses some terms that, that I'll be the person to interrupt and say, what does that mean? But he's an amazing man. He is a gentleman, for example, to give you a perspective, who's taken part now in more than 10,000 businesses. Uh, more than 10,000 companies are using his principles to run their businesses successfully. He's earned more than $20 million just from his consulting fees in the last 20 years by adding value to companies, by coming in with a brand new perspective about how do you get your message across? How do you get people to want your product or service? So I want to get across a couple things to you. Number one is you listen. Listen carefully for those distinctions that will relate to not only where you are today in your life, but where you will be in the future. Today you may not own a business, but what he's talking about, about how to market a business, you can relate to a future business you may own, or you can relate to the idea of marketing yourself within your own company so you are valued. So if there is a downsizing that occurs, people will see the real value that you have. And the principles he shares are also quite fundamental. 
they require us to think differently. So I can tell you all about his accolades in terms of his write-ups in the LA Times and Success Magazine and the founders of Federal Express, but I think what's more important is who this man is and what he can share with you. So without any more platitudes, I think I should invite him into this conversation. Jay, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tony. Listen, we're here in San Diego, so you may hear some jets flying over our head uh, because we're right next to the Top Gun School, which is kind of appropriate dealing with you, sir. You are a Top Gun. I understand now that you uh, charge $3,000 an hour for consulting, and uh, most of that is done by telephone. You're not even there in most cases. Your seminars often cost between $5,000 and $25,000, depending upon how many people you allow to be in there. What makes you worth this kind of money to businesses and individuals? What do you do, sir? I teach almost any kind of business or professional, Tony, how to harvest the windfall profit that's sitting in every business and most people don't allow themselves to mine. I teach people how to turn one-shot sales into ongoing perpetual streams of income and I think I teach them how to have a lot more fun basically competing and uh, gaining competitive advantage over everybody in their marketplace or in their industry. I've heard you say many times that you think that virtually every business you've ever looked at, and you've looked at more than 10,000, has between, I think you said, 10,000 and a million dollars of asset, of dollars that are just sitting on the table that they really aren't seeing. And quite honestly, when I first read some of your materials, I thought, this is like a lot of hyperbole. But as I've gotten to know you personally throughout the years, and as I've seen the, the hundreds and hundreds of cases, I mean, you really have consistently produced those results. Where is this money? Where do we find this within our businesses? Is it really there? Yes. It has to do with uh, an interesting aspect of leverage that not one in a thousand business owners, uh, CEOs, or accountants ever recognizes that the intangible assets. And that means the advertising, marketing, sales, goodwill, customer relationships, distribution centers, and expertises that a company possesses and ways they could infinitely more effectively, productively use them to their advantage. So let's talk about what that really means. You know, Peter Drucker, like most business people, we're both pretty good fans of his, and he says that really there are two questions in business. Question one is, what business are you in? And question two is, how's business? Yes. <laughs> he said, that's it. I would say there is a, probably a third question, with all due respect to, to Mr. Drucker, and that is, how do you improve business? Which is really the question you tend to answer. He also said that all businesses, they're designed to bring in a customer. That's the only purpose of a business. That's right. And that can only be accomplished through marketing and through innovation. That those are the only two functions of business and that everything else is an expense. That's true. So tell me, let's say you're going to walk into my business tomorrow. You're going to walk into a local entrepreneurship. What would be the first thing you'd sit down to show them how to, quote, harvest these profits that aren't there? What would you do? Let's make this practical. Maybe sure. give us an example. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, I can do an inventory right now. I can do a little self-audit. Would that be useful? Sure. Okay. The first thing I look at is what are you doing that you're not getting leverage enough out of? And, what does that mean? Well, it means this. Every business, knowingly or otherwise, is engaging in certain money-rendering, selling, or customer or prospect generating processes they don't even recognize, let alone measure and analyze. Until and unless they recognize what they are and they measure how they're doing, they can't begin to see how much better they could be performing. Now, let me stop and talk a little bit about leverage in the new context that we're going to talk about. Okay. Most people, particularly people who have a financial bent, think of leverage as having two quotients to it, upside potential, downside risk. That happens when you buy real estate. That happens when you lease a piece of capital equipment. That happens when you uh, buy any other kind of an investment with a little or nothing down and uh, a future payment obligation. I don't want to deal with that. I want to deal with the most wonderful kind of leverage each and every business person and probably almost everybody who is gainfully employed in any activity to an employer has, and that's upside leverage, parenthetically. It costs you as an employer, as a businessman or woman, as a professional, the same fixed amount, no matter what it is you do to drive business into your company. If you run ads, if you have salespeople, if you generate a referral type of a subtle, understated type of approach, if you do direct mailings, if you have outside field people, if you use manufacturers reps, if you run ads in trade publications, if you do trade shows, whatever you do costs you X to be in business to drive customers right. into. Okay, but that X is a fixed cost and it has no correlation to how the action or the process performs. In other words, you're going to pay that much no matter how much reward you receive. Exactly. 
the same ad that cost you $10,000 in tomorrow's Sunday LA Times can produce one order or call, 10 orders, 110. The same mailing piece can pull a half a percent response, 3%, 10%. The same salesman or woman can close one out of 25 people called on, one out of 15, one out of five, one out of two. Correspondingly, that's only the first layer of this wonderful upside leverage everyone has and few people recognize. So explain to me for a second then so we don't, you don't lose me or the group here so I understand exactly what you're saying. You're saying in most investments, I'm going to invest my money and I've got a potential return, but I've got also a potential loss. You're saying in a business... Most time, that loss is very eminent and very frequently occurs. Okay, so in other words, there's a, there's a great chance that I'm going to lose my money in the investment unless I'm going to get a very small return. I'm going to put in a savings account or That's a money right. market or something like that. But if I want to get a large return, a decent return, if I want to get a 20% return or more, I'm going to be aggressive and I have a great chance of losing my money or a portion of my capital. You're saying in a business, because of the power of marketing, there are ways of leveraging my money where Up. I get a 20 or 30 or 40 times return for my money. Or 200 or 400 or 2,000. Which I'm really not going to find in any in passive investment per se. Well, particularly with zero, with zero downside. Now, how do you get zero downside? I know you talk about this. Well, I mean, you often say that, listen, if you want to really develop wealth, the way to do it is through you know, your own business um, as opposed to passive investment because the upside is so much greater and there's almost no downside. And yet the reality that we read every day in the newspaper tells us that two out of three businesses that begin five years from now are going to be around. So that's, what do you that, mean? That, that's exactly right because they don't use any of these dynamics. Okay, so tell me what you mean then. Uh, how do we achieve this leverage and at the same time produce the level of security you're talking about? Yeah, well, first it comes from analyzing, measuring, identifying and then replacing certain underperforming aspects of your selling, your marketing, your advertising operations with alternatives that perform better. And that's what you're an expert really at doing. I would say so. Yeah. Give me an example where you've done that so we get some kind of a frame of reference. Give us an example where a portion of a business was underperforming or the marketing was underperforming. You came in. What was the result? Okay. I'll give you two or three real quick. Okay. First of all, I got to give you a, a reference frame. You got to think about what could be underperforming. The salespeople could be underperforming. Okay. Their presentation could not be closing. Okay. Their, their direction, the markets they're going after. There's all kinds. You could be having your salespeople work their heart out, but calling on the wrong quality prospect. Okay. You can have them working their hearts out, calling on the right prospects, but making the wrong proposition. You can have them working their, their hearts out, calling on the right prospects, making the right proposition, but not having the right risk reversal to induce people and make it easy to reduce the barrier of entry. You can have all kinds. You can have an ad going off without... I'm going to come back and ask you about risk reversal okay. later, but go ahead. You can have an ad running or a letter going, and because it has the wrong beginning or no beginning, it can underperform its capacity by as much as 20 or 30 times. So what I... I'll give you a couple examples. Years ago, I worked with a brokerage firm that was selling precious metals. They ran ads in the Wall Street Journal. They happened to have had a relationship with a bank that was bank finance. They ran ads for bank finance purchases of silver and gold. The headline said, two-thirds bank financing on silver and gold. When they ran the ads, the ads pulled okay. They brought back a profit. The salespeople made commissions adequate enough to stay. The owners made salaries. The overhead was paid. They had money left to keep running the ads. They were right. happy. Right. But they hadn't questioned how much higher is high. In other words, what's the real ultimate leverage if I really, if these ads could pull more? That's right. If we could improve them. So they began to accept it because it was profitable, as opposed to raising the standard to say, I want a 20 or 30 times return. And that's not only possible, but there's a way to do it. I'm going to find it. And that's what you helped to do. Now, how did you do that? Well, I immediately asked them if they'd ever tested headlines. By the way, most people try to redo ads. That's, that's the most inefficient thing in the world. If an ad basically pulls, the first thing you change is the opening statement. In a, in a fixed print ad, it's the headline. In a direct mailing, it could be a headline, it could be the opening phrase. In a direct selling situation, it's the first paragraph you as a salesperson utter. Same thing if I walk in your retail store. It's the first group of words the person who meet them utters or anything in between. That whole frame of reference is burned out but true that you don't get a second chance to make a good first impression. Mm -hmm. So you change that first impression. Right, and the trick is two things. The goal is to make the first statement a statement of the powerful self-serving result the prospective customer is going to receive from availing themselves of your product or service. So this is something else that I've heard you talk about many times, which is that most people think people are buying a product. Not well, true. What are they buying? They're all buying a result. They're buying a benefit. They're buying an outcome that's very self-serving to the end user. People could care 
why you're in business. People could care if you need to make payroll. People could care if you're the greatest or the worst. They don't want to even be intruded upon. The only reason they deal with you or they let you deal with them is to some extent or another, they see an advantage in it for themselves. The, the greater, the clearer, the more powerful you are at expressing, articulating, demonstrating, illustrating, comparing how you render that advantage better than anyone else you deal with, the more business you get. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, but but in, in truth though, the secret is being able to do that as quickly as possible, especially in today's society where people get so little attention to something. They want their needs met, they want it met now. That's the purpose of having a powerful opening premise, a headline, a prefacing statement that is either uttered, written, or printed. So back to my story, I got on a tangent. This company had never tested headlines. They were doing great, they thought. I said, well, let's try three, just hypothetically. And I tried three, it took me three minutes to write them. We tested them, one headline changed. One did a little bit better, about 10%. One did about the same, it was negligible. One improved the yield of the ad they were running by five times, or 500%. Wow. This was back when gold was not selling very high. It was $300 for gold and about $6 for silver. Remember, they were saying two-thirds bank financing on silver and gold. Right. Keep in mind, my question is always, but what does that mean to me as right. the customer? It meant nothing. So what? I changed the headline. All I said was, if gold is selling for $300 an ounce, send us just $100 an ounce and we'll buy you all the gold you want. And I had one for silver. If silver is selling for $6 an ounce, send us just $2 an ounce and we'll send you all the silver you want. Wow, well, what a great change of meaning. It was the people. same statement, but more powerfully denominated in the context of what's in it for me. Right. What's the result? How do I benefit? Right. That one simple change, it was all about 12 words, made the same amount of space they were buying, the exact same about a body copy, which was 90% of the ad, not pull $50,000 every time they ran it, but start pulling 250,000. And I was getting a profit share and they sent me 30 grand a month for about, I don't know, 12 months just from that one change. But that's one example. Another example, I teach people- It was a good three minutes. It was good. <laughs> I teach people, I teach people how to identify, analyze and measure what I call the marginal net worth or the lifetime value of a customer. When I meet people, I ask them a couple questions and it's pretty amazing. The first question I say is, in a minute or less, tell me what it is about your business that gives greater advantage, greater benefit, greater result to your customer than your competitors. And most business owners will say nothing or they'll say quality, service, dependability. Which everybody says. Which is negligible, it doesn't mean anything. Well, the next thing I ask them, and I'll get into that later, the next thing I ask them is, what is the lifetime value of a customer? And they look at me and I say, well, let me ask you this question. How much do you spend for advertising? How much do you spend on selling? How much do you spend on promotion? And they'll say nothing or they'll say X. And I'll say, well, how do you formulate that? And they'll say, well, we just sort of allocate it. And I'll say, well, doesn't it make better sense to first of all figure out what a customer is worth to you, worst case, the first time you sell them. If you sell 100 customers, not the best, what's the average worst case going to be that they're going to be worth in unit of sales and then a corresponding profit? Of those 100 customers, how many will come back if you do nothing else but just let them just migrate the way they do in month one or month two or, mm -hmm. or, or year one? How many will go year two, et cetera? And what will the projected long-term value that each customer is to you in, in net bottom line profit be? No one ever looks at that. In my mind, until you know what a customer is and will be worth, you can't possibly understand how much you can afford to do or spend to acquire them. Back at the story. I had a client, a fascinating little client. They sold fluid transmission products. You know what that is? Yeah. PVC pipe yeah, that carries sure. fluid for manufacturing, for ag agriculture. They came to me and they said, oh, all oh, is for, for Lauren. They were almost out of money. They had six salespeople doing whatever they wanted to do, not managed, trying to sell farmers and manufacturers. And they had a compensation program. It was pure commission. The salespeople got approximately 10% of the profit. If they made $1,000 on something, the sales would get 100 the, the house or the company would get 900 they said, well, what can you do? Come up with some brilliant idea. I said, it doesn't need to be brilliant. All you got to do is tell me what the lifetime value or the marginal net worth of your customer is. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, go back and come back in a week and tell me, first of all, what the average worst case new customer is worth to you in unit sale the first time. Worst case, how many times that customer will buy from you in the first year. Worst case, how many years they'll be with you. They were shocked. They came back. They did a reconstruction. Turned out that the, that the worst case, the customer, I'm not going to tell you the gross sale because that doesn't matter. From a profit standpoint, the initial first sale on average, worst case, was about $200 gross profit to the company. Right. Of that, 20 went to the salesman or woman, right. 180 went to the company. 
on average, the average customer bought from the company, let's see, five times a year for three years. Wow. So it was basically each time they got a new customer in the door, they were accruing $3,000 in cumulative profits they'd never recognized. I said, well, your problem's simple. They said, well, what? And I said, all you got to do is set up a basis with your salespeople where as long as they keep their production levels from their existing customers at or above what they've averaged in the past, give them 100% of the profit on every new sale that they accrue. They'll be 10 times more motivated to bring in new customers That's than they were okay. in the past. So they make $200 instead of $20. But every time they made $200, the house was accruing $2,800. 20, yeah, 2800 right. And they said, well, it won't work. And I said, try it. Make a long story short, it tripled sales. And it was, took me about three minutes to figure that out. It doesn't have to be that hard, Tony. Well, let's talk about uh, the business you did with Icy Hot. I think that's another good example of this. And what we're really talking about is leverage. How do you really get a result that's multiplied many times just by using some ingenuity? I mean, this is what I call regeneration. You're taking these dormant resources, you're using human ingenuity to look at it in a brand new way, redeploy those assets in a new way, and get a tremendous increase in the quality of life, either for the business or your life. I also want to relate this to people who maybe don't own a business. Because people who own a business still have resources within themselves that have to re be redeployed. Some of the same ingenuity, oh, some of the same thinking process. They're not leveraging their time. They're not leveraging their creativity to get the greatest result. Or their knowledge the base or expertise. Well, give me an example of that then. Let's talk about what kind of sure. individual who doesn't own a business. And Actually, I'm, I'm bouncing around here. Doesn't I want to give me an example also of this uh, business Icy Hot because I thought that was a great example of leverage as well. Okay. Why don't you start with that and then let's talk about what we can do for an individual. Yeah, there's three stories. The first story is most people... They allocate in their business a budget. It can be a sales budget, it can be an advertising budget, it can be a marketing budget. I've learned from masters that you have an infinite upside budget if you stop looking at budgetary figures and start looking at, at allocating an allowable cost per sale or per lead or per okay. transaction. So instead of saying we've got $100,000 in our budget here to produce sales for this particular event or situation, you, I want to say I've got a certain number of people. I'll spend $25, up to $25 a prospect or up to $100 a sale, and you can bring me all the sales you can for because that. Because I know that there's a back end. Because you've analyzed and you right. know the residual value, the, the stream of income, the lifetime value if you do nothing else. And that day we're going to get really excited later. We can show you 20 different things you can do to make that higher, but if you do nothing else, you understand that. So I worked with a company that sold a patent medicine like Bengay or Mentholatum that was called Iciat. It still is called Iciat. It's a glob of gelatinous goop, a balm of, of menthol, menthol salve, and it happens to have a very good therapeutic external effect on bursitis, neuritis, arthritis, and other kind of rheumatic type things, and it's a temporary and a very blessed relief-giving product, a quite a, a good qualitative product. We bought this old company that had almost no business. We were going to put it under and just use its facilities, but we kept getting letters and letters and letters from little old men and women who'd been buying it for years and years, begging us to keep selling it because it was the only thing they could use to get their arms moving and their legs walking and their pain subsiding. So we decided, okay, let's try to build this. But we didn't have a lot of money, and we had, but we had this philosophy of not paying for advertising, paying for results. Product sold for $3 for a jar. We went to advertising mediums galore. We went to 1,000 radio stations. We went to 200 television stations. We went to about 100 magazines. We went to, I think, 100 catalog companies and mail order companies. We went to all kinds of other non-traditional forms of selling you wouldn't even understand. And we went to them and we said, if you will offer our product for sale to your customers, first, it will not be any kind of a competitive product because it only adds value. Sure. Number two, it sells for $3. You may keep 100%. Everyone thought we were crazy. What? Selling something for $3 and, and not making even the cost of producing the goods? So you actually, I mean, you gave them the product for free, let them sell it and make all the profit. And keep the money. And keep all the money. All we asked them to do was send us promptly the name and the address of the customer so uh -huh. we could make certain that customer got their product promptly and were satisfied. Uh -huh. Now, why would we do that? Because we had analyzed from the past what the residual or marginal net or lifetime value of a customer was. And we found out that every time we brought in two, one of them would migrate for about 10 purchases a year and make us about $25 net, net, net. Every time we gave up, not $3, because it wasn't costing us $3, it was costing us about 45 cents in volume to make the product, put it in a jar, ship it out bulk rate to the customer. Every time we sent it out, we sent it out with a coupon offering them all kinds of other things. And on every 100 ones we sent out, we not only would get back 50 orders, but we'd get back another 20 orders for other products we have. So it was a cash flow 
loss of 45 cents, but from a practical standpoint, after the first group of sales, we were all ahead of the game. And every time we got new customers, they would repurchase over and over and over and over again. And we never had a budget. We had an unlimited budget because we would only pay for sales, not advertising. Hmm. We just basically said, keep all the $3. It got to the point where it, as sales slowed down, we paid $3.45 for them to sell $3. Oh my gosh. They thought we that were crazy. It makes total sense. Yeah, but that makes total sense. But we built a company from $20,000 to $13 million in 18 months. It sold for many tens of million dollars to uh, G.D. Searle, a big pharmaceutical company. You can still find it now. Uh, we accidentally, by the way, we got $18 million of free advertising that didn't cost us a dime the first year through this because we didn't pay for advertising. We paid for results. It's Amazing. a whole different way of looking at business. It's fantastic. Now, that, that's the kind of leverage you're talking about where it's only upside. There was no downside for you in this no. versus any investment you and I were going to make. There's always going to be a risk. That's so exactly. there's still some risk here, but it was pr pretty muted. Well, see, you understand the, the, the only risk you ever have to have in anything you do is an inexpensive test. If you test variables in your business, so getting on a new tangent, but this is fascinating. Most people don't test anything. Most people make decisions that cause or cost or, or impact the entire fate and destiny of an enterprise or a career or a life based on conjecture. I will not do that. Um, I did it once, it cost me a million six, but I won't <laughs> do it anymore. Basically what I learned is every aspect of a business can be tested, can be measured, can be examined, can be compared, can be improved just by trying one way of doing something against another. One headline against another can be 21 times difference. One price point against another could be as much as 10 times different. One way of articulating or presenting or stating your proposition against another could be five times difference. One price point can pull three, 10, 15 times difference. One way of stating or illustrating a guarantee can pull three to five times difference. Well, if you keep testing things like that, it's not just you've gotten 12 times different or five, it's an exponential because they all work together. That's how you get 3,000, 5,000% increases. In a business. Well, In a what's business. interesting is the thing that stops people is I don't think most business people realize that one, the power of one distinction, the power of one slight change. I think most people think about improvement in terms of constant, never ending improvement, maybe at the very best. Oh, we're going to keep making this thing a little bit better. Instead of saying, there is a way, and I just need to find it, of organizing my resources, articulating or marketing what I'm doing that would bring mass number of people here. It's the mindset that seems to stop people, it seems to me. How do you help people? We said business is marketing and innovation. How do you teach businesses to innovate? And, I, and also, maybe I can tie into this. You say there's really only three ways to grow a business. Let's talk about that. How do you really grow a business exponentially? Well, as you know, my biggest plight in life is people don't believe that I can do what I do because they say, well, you can't grow a business and double or triple it in, in, in a year. You can't, you can't make an extra $200,000 when all we made was $100,000 all of last year. But it's not me. It's a function of how little they demand out of themselves and their investment, human and financial, in their business. So how you grow a business is very simple. There are only three ways to grow any enterprise. It doesn't matter what business you're in. You either increase the number of customers or prospects. You increase the unit of sale. Or you increase... When we say unit of sale just for everyone, you mean by unit of sale what specifically? Okay. Whatever people buy. If they buy something from you, you look at what's the average unit of purchase. Do people buy $100? They buy $1,000? Whatever it is, that's the unit of sale. Okay. So you increase the number of customers. That's the first way you can increase your business, grow your business. You increase the unit of sale. You increase the frequency of purchase or stated otherwise. You increase the residual value that customer is worth to you. So in other words, we've got to either figure out how to drive more people in the door, right. or we've got to raise our price potentially or get more money each time we finally do make that sale, or we've got to be in a position where we make sure yeah. there is a back-end sale, that once they bought that product, they're going to buy our product again and again. So the money we spent to get that customer is, means little to us because we've got a lot of profit on the back end. But here's the exciting point. Do any one, and you can grow geometric. Right. Do any combination of, of the three, and you grow exponential, case in point. Most people doing nothing, with no formal understanding of any of these dynamics, principles, distinctions, marketing, anything, left to their own devices over whatever period of time they've been in their business. They have gotten to a point where they have evolved to where they have a finite number of customers, whatever it is, X. Those customers left to their own without any direction, any great 
sales ability on the part of the companies, any programming, any experimentation, they've evolved to where there's a certain fixed unit of sale that's average, and they buy a certain number of times without anybody doing anything. If all you did was become a little bit more effective, a little bit more proficient, a little bit more adroit at selling, you could probably close a few more customers, and it sure. doesn't take, I mean, you probably double it because most people are so inept, but the, that's not meant to be disrespectful. It's just a statement of, it's like computer. Well, you've experienced with 10,000 yeah, businesses. That's right, 99% <laughs> don't do any of the things they could. So I would say you could probably get almost anybody a 40, 60, 80% increase in, in category one, the number of customers, but let's say all you did was get them 10%. Okay. Same thing with the unit of sale. Doing nothing, the average person buys X. If you got them with a little bit of programming, a little bit of value orientation, a little bit of result understanding and positioning people to realize what they were getting out of it as a customer, it's not hard to get your unit of sale up 10%. Right. If people are buying, coming back on their own volition X times a year, if you just program them, if you gave them a basis. What do you basis, mean program them? What do you mean? Well, I mean, when people start a buying relationship, you have inordinate opportunity to ethically program people for forever. People are coming to you for guidance. If they favor you with their purchase, it means they trust you. They look to you to have ability, expertise, integrity. If you, at that point, show them the reasons why in their self-interest they should be coming back and repurchasing your product or other services or the logical extension, what the frequency should be, just connect to them or give them an inducement at the point of purchase or on a cumulative basis, like frequent flyer miles or something, to get them to keep coming back at a certain okay. number of intervals you normally will get get many more what I call turns per year or purchases. And that can be incredibly Im impactful to growing your business. But if you only increased it from whatever it is now by a lousy 10%, remember we increased the customers by 10%? Right. We increased the unit of sale by 10%. We increased the repurchase frequency by 10%. Okay. What have you done for your business? Remember I said if you do any one, you grow geometrically. Geometrically, right. But if you just increased all three categories by a mere 10%, you haven't grown 10%. You've grown 33 and a third percent. And that 33 and a third percent could be all the profit the business makes, so the profit could be massive. If you grow each one of those categories more, grow 125%, 118%, 122%, the cumulative effect is like 90% increase in your sales. You've gone wow. exponential. And when we get companies to go triple the effectiveness of their selling or bringing in customers or prospects, doubling or tripling their ability to get the unit of sale. And unit of sale does not necessarily mean you raise your prices, although sometimes when you do that, you get more business. It means perhaps bringing together a greater advantage and a better package that sells for more, that gives the customer more sense of value. Or they might buy more That's of right. the That's right. Or getting them to purchase and commit now and take delivery in lots over the future, but something that gets the unit of purchase to a higher level. That it's easier to be exponential than it is to be geometric. It's easier to grow massively than it is to grow slowly. It's easier to be successful than it is unsuccessful. How can you say that? I be agree with you, by the way, but I've got to play devil's oh, advocate that's okay. here. <laughs> Well, because I guess it goes to, be, to the fact that I've seen how few people understand how to optimize their time, their money, their opportunity. The moment you understand that, you got a clear playing field because you can do things that are so much more effective. You can make a dollar go so much further. You can make a customer last so much longer. You can make an activity produce so much greater current, future, and this is going to be wild, reclamational benefit that it's like it's no contest. Well, you've opened up several loops there for me to help close. Let me, let me come back to it then. Now, what stops people from optimizing? Because that's really the term we're really talking about here is how do you really optimize? What okay. is optimization? Well, Let's talk about let, that. Let me tell you what stops them. And what stops them? This Mindset, gonna, right? Well, I'm going to say this. Their expertise. Mm. They have too much expertise, too deep. It's the difference between tunnel vision and funnel vision. Hmm. Most people have been in their, their, their career or their field or their business or their profession so long they know it so well, but all they know is the way that their industry operates. If you look at any field, a widget company, a retail company, a professional practice, a manufacturing industry, almost everyone competing in that industry, every player, every separate competitor is doing plus or minus about 20% the same thing, the same way. Some are more proficient, more able, more skilled in a selling, in a marketing, in an advertising, in a reselling, in a, et cetera. 
But they're all basically doing the same thing, same thing the, same the same way. way. Right. Why? Because they have such expertise technically, but all they know is what they know, and, and all they know is what they see other people doing because they used to work with somebody else, or they tutored or interned with somebody who used to work with somebody else who learned it because they learned it from somebody else who a generation or a decade ago did it the same way. I've been privy of uh, looking at 400 separate industries. When you look at 400 separate industries, you, re you get two things. It's like traveling. You travel outside of Los Angeles, you see there's a lot of different lifestyles than the one in L.A. When you travel outside of California, you see there's a lot of different climate and a lot of different values. When you travel outside of the United States, you see that there's a lot of different cultures, a lot of different values, a lot of different work ethics, a lot of different climates, temperatures, exotic things. It gives, you, it gives you a broader selection of choices for your life. As and possibilities. Does, and exactly. It gives right. you a reference frame. You call it many more distinctions. When right. I got the privilege of traveling amongst 400 separate unrelated industries, I saw, to my fascination, the fact that if you look at 100 industries, almost 95 of them drive their enterprise, bring in their customers, run their operations from a totally different marketing context than, than one another. In other words, industry A operates from a marketing aspect totally different than industry well, give B. Give me an example. Okay, great. Let's take a manufacturing concern. Most of them basically sell with either manufacturers reps or ads in trade publications or going to trade shows. That's all they do. They don't telemarket. They don't do direct mail. They don't do joint ventures with other people that already have their customers. They don't basically get endorsements in, in publications. They don't do any of the possibilities. But certain people, if you look at the basic 10 ways most people drive their business, and when I name these 10 ways, there may only be five when I, when I tally them, you'll find that every company or every industry, has, they can relate, they can resonate. One of these ways is going to be how 80 or 90 or 100% of their business emanates. Way one might be running ads in consumer publications. Way two might be running ads in trade publications. Way three might be generating leads and converting them through direct mail or through telemarketing or through some other kind of mechanism like a trade show. Mechanism four might be telemarketing. Mechanism five might be retailing. Mechanism six might be a catalog. Mechanism seven might be a separate subcontract representation. I can name probably 25 if I was asked to. You will find that almost every business has one of them that is the predominant way they drive their business. I see. So that's their primary the focus. They don't even understand the, the other. Real estate industry, they've got a realtor out there who's going to be going out there and doing it using some of these tools. And most realtors basically knock on doors cold or run they ads. sit no, or they run ads that nobody reads and it doesn't have any offer of any benefit or result that's in, in, in store for the reader who might want to buy or sell a home or they stand for 12 hours quietly and silently and vacantly in an in a open house that no one comes to see. <laughs> you make it sound so compelling, Jay. <laughs> well, to me, it's just a, such a dissipation of effort, energy, and the most precious commodity we have so what would you is do time. With it? So what would you do with that realtor? To have that realtor be more effective, they would use some of these other avenues of marketing. I would teach them leverage. Okay, so what, let's, look at, let's take a real. We've got this realtor right here. What would you? How would you teach them to leverage their time or their well, effectiveness? The first thing I would do is go back in time, which is what I you asked me about. I'll draw a parallel. It's any company I look at, the first thing I say is, how much more can you do with the customers you've got? Can you resell them? Can you sell them more times? Can you sell them more things? If you have nothing else to sell them, can you sell them products or services that align, that complement, that are synergistic to what they sell? I'd go to a realtor and say the following things. Number one, have you sold anybody's house in the last two years? If the answer is yes, before I do anything else, I'd say, are they happy? And if they said they don't know, I, said, I would say, you obviously didn't do your job correctly because part of your job is to make them see and seize the great advantage you have rendered them that nobody else could have made. So we go back and teach them how to express to customers of theirs or clients from now forward how much of an advantage, how much of a benefit, how much of, of a greater result they will get or they did get or they should get by favoring this realtor over everybody else. So in other words, this realtor is going to add value in a way no other realtor would have. And if they don't understand how I'm going to teach them how, and that takes a little time to explain, but we can get into that in a minute. Number two, I'm going to go back to all the old customers they ever called on. And I'm going to have them contact them all and reiterate to them so they can better appreciate what they did for them in the process of selling their house, of representing them, of negotiating the purchase. So they have a greater appreciation. So it becomes evident when they ask this question, do you think you were benefited? Do you think you were advantaged by having me serve you instead of somebody else? The moment you position them to say yes, you ethically set them up for the next question. Then in the scope of your life, Tony, you must at any given point, knowing the moving parade of life, meaning the changes, the, the continuum going up and down, 
You must have an inordinate number of friends, of relatives, of co-workers, of church members, of associates who are either because of changes in their life, because of children moving out, because of deaths, because of divorce, because of improvements in their, in their stature, are either in the process of wanting to sell or wanting to purchase a home or a second home or a different home. If the answer is yes, and as you just agreed, you feel that I benefited you better than anyone else, the greatest service it would seem like we could do for them, you and I together, is to contact them and at least get them to seek out my best research professional opinion on what the best strategy of action, what the best approach they should take, what the best sites they should set on would be, irrespective of whether they buy from me or not. And I'd program them to go back and get their customers to sell for them because that's the greatest leverage in the world. Now, some people say, well, that's pretty basic. That's just, you know, creating referrals and getting them to do that. But uh, what's your answer to that? And well, when, when you ask people how they get referrals, most people say, I ask people to give me the names of people I can call on. That's not what I said, Tony. Right. What I said is you go back and you first reestablish or establish for the first time the distinction of the inordinate value you brought to that person or you will bring to that person because of the effort, because of the expertise, because of the performance, because of the knowledge, because of the representation you're going to render that no one else could. You get them to concede what that is worth to them in both intangible and tangible terms, in pleasure, in protection, in exhilaration, in getting a bigger house and having no problems and selling and not having to worry about it falling out of escrow and whatever they're not going to worry about. Right. Then you get them to, to, to dominate it in dollars. That isn't it true that I probably, because of the work we did and the strategy we had, probably got you the house at the best price possible? Isn't it true you probably saved twenty or thirty or fifty thousand dollars? Or isn't it true that we thought originally we might have to get two hundred thousand, but instead by using the strategy we worked out together and me holding true and you respecting me for it, we got you an extra thirty five. So you denominate what it really meant to them in terms. So they see it as being a real value, as something that, that is tangible as I call it a sandwich. Half feeling have real perceived tangible value. Okay, interesting. So you do that. Once you do that, it That gives you the leverage for the person to really want to, to help you and because they're not just helping you, they're helping their friends is the truth. You're talking about it in terms of their self interest. not even help. Again. It's a moral issue. I mean, you have a choice. If you have a friend and you know that friend, and that friend is important to you, you have two choices. You can allow that friend to make the wrong decision and pay $30,000 more. You can allow that friend to sell his or her house to somebody and because that somebody doesn't give them great representation, they may let him sell it out for twenty or thirty thousand dollars less. You can allow that friend to trust somebody who's in such a hurry to do the deal that it gets all screwed up in escrow and falls out, and the friend gets all screwed up and may compromise. Or you can take it upon yourself because that friend is important to you, and you trust and and revere the friendship, and you want their life to be enriched and benefited. To put them in touch with me, couldn't you? <laughs> yes, Jay. <laughs> no, I mean, that may be a little evangelical, but that may be a little over, over dramatization, but that's the way I, I, I believe it. But I, and, and your passion comes through. Now, the truth is, if you were talking to someone who didn't define themselves as a realtor, but define themselves as an entrepreneur, the reality is you probably would go back to that person and say, what other resource does that person need? Not just the additional customers they could bring to you through referral process, but you'd be probably looking at ways in which to leverage your relationship to meet other needs that they have through products or services, wouldn't you not? I would. The first thing I'd do, because most people never, I mean, you talked a little bit about optimization. Can I introduce yeah, that please. and come back? Yes, please. I believe, I've been very lucky, I've been very influenced by you. I think you're brilliant, and I think you're, you're um, demanding that people challenge themselves to see how high is high is a wonderful breakthrough. I've also done work with a lot of other people, as you know, who, who were seminal thinkers in different fields. And I got the privilege of working with the people who conducted the seminars for W. Edwards Deming. I think sure. he was a seminal thinker. And I think what he, his thinking was more powerfully applicable for entrepreneurs and professionals than it even was in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. He extolled a philosophy of optimization, which in my in my paraphrasing is basically you should never do anything unless you can get the maximum benefit, the maximum yield currently and forever from the minimal waste and the minimal effort. And in order to do that, you've got to understand a couple of, I guess you'd say, distinctions. First of all, everything a business does is a process. And as a process, it can be measured, it can be compared, it can be quantified, it can be improved. Give us examples. Okay. You own the business. You called on customers in the past probably to start the business. You probably started it, and when it was a small business, you didn't have a sales force. You probably were it. You became so adroit, so adept, so capable at calling on people, and perhaps unconsciously or subconsciously presenting the greatest advantage to them that you probably had a very high success rate of both 
closure, meaning if you called on 10 people, you probably sold five, and the average person you sold probably bought $1,000 or $2,000. Okay, but most people probably aren't as passionate, as clear, as demanding, as capable. Your average salesperson now might need to call on 25 people to sell one, and his or her average sale might be 200 instead of the 1,000 that you average and could go out and average tomorrow. Okay. Okay. You run an ad. You run an ad in the LA Times. That ad produces 50 responses. You run an ad in another publication. It only produces 10 responses. Those responses come in. One time you'll close 50%. Through whatever process, telephone selling, sending out literature, giving them brochures, going in their home, having them come to you. Another time, you only sell 20%. Well, there's processes galore. You've got to measure and analyze what processes impact your business, what the dynamics are. There are two sets of dynamics. One, the dynamics that bring action to bear, and then two, the dynamics that impact the dollars that keep flowing in. In other words, certain factors bring more or less people in or convert more or less right. people. Other factors impact the dollars those people spend and the frequency or the continuation of that so expenditure. So you're back end again. Yes. Okay. So you got to measure all that. Okay, so that's one. That's the first principle we got okay. from Deming. Okay, so what you do, you measure it. So whatever you do, whatever you, you are right now is what's called your baseline. Whatever it is, it is. You know, you know if basically on average, and the key is on average, on average when you run an ad, that ad basically you spend $5,000, it brings in 10000 That's your baseline. If on average when you make a presentation or you get 250 prospects or 50 prospects come in your facilities or you call 50 prospects and you convert X, X is your baseline on right. average. Right. Whatever the unit of sale is your baseline. You got all these baselines. Okay. Your goal is first of all to identify what your baseline is and then identify what the variance is. And the variance is the differing performance levels that occur when other people or other mechanisms are used and some are better and some are worse. Okay. Your goal as a business owner is very simple. It's to raise the baseline and lower the variance. Okay. So how do you do that? Great question. Okay. It's simple. <laughs> you test conservatively differing ways of doing each process to try to get improvement. And when you get improvement, you do one of potentially two things. You either replace what was working or what was your baseline or what we'll call your control process in a category. Right with that which produces greater or, and this is where people really drop the ball, sometimes they're good enough to find a better control and they drop what was working before. You don't necessarily have to drop what was working as long as it was profitable because it may be impacting a different segment of a trial market. Okay. You may want to build a broad base with different pillars. Right. Is that getting too complicated? No, no, I think you're on track there. So in other words, one of the things that, I've, that you've talked about in the past is that if you're going to be effective, not only you got to measure what you've got, you've got to know exactly what you can count on, but you've got to be able to find a way to leverage to get a greater result. So everything we've talked about matches That's what gives that. you predictability to your business. And future, people don't say, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do in the future. You know exactly what you're going to do in the future, plus or minus a small variance, once you measure, quantify, and project out. Plus, you know, you can't manage something you can't measure. That's right. And, and the truth is you can measure almost anything, but people have never really been taught to do that in it's business. It's very easy. Now, one of the things that you've said in the past is the major reasons businesses fail is because, as you said earlier, most businesses have one primary way to bring customers in, and then if something disrupts that, and something external, something in the government, something in the economy, something, a new kind of competitor, maybe a worldwide or international competitor, suddenly that business is in trouble or it literally goes out of business. It's true. Let's describe for us that dynamic and, and what's the solution to that dynamic. How do we make sure that we have long-term, not only predictability, but profitability in any business enterprise we're a part of? Okay, well, I'm gonna use two graphic analogies. I believe you build your success foundation on pillars. I'm going to call the diving board analogy versus the Parthenon. Okay. Okay. Most businesses I look at, and I shudder to say most of the businesses or the business owners or the professionals listening to this tape would be what I call the diving board. Imagine a diving board that has one post holding the board. The board is your foundation. The post is the method or the mechanism you have either consciously or unconsciously depended on to generate and drive and fuel all your, your sales, all your customers, all your sustained growth. Okay. What is a diving board by nature? What does it do? It goes down. If that one pillar that you have built your business on either gets saturated, stops being effective, gets competed against because someone else starts becoming more proficient, remember the 10 to 15% better or worse? Right. Somebody does it better than you, 
your business is over. I believe the diving board collapses. The diving board collapses because diving boards won't are, hold you up anymore. They go down. What are you diving boards used for? Not going up. <laughs> okay. And too often times people do a perfect triple off the high, but there's no water in the pool. So, <laughs> so basically, my goal for a client or any company or my wish for anybody listening to this interview is that you systematically, and it's part of this concept of optimization, which I'll go back to in a minute, you systematically create your business to be based upon multiple pillars that support it. One pillar can be whatever it is you do now. The next pillar will be another alternative form of selling or of generating business or of lead generating. Another pillar, so it could be that one facet of your business is direct selling. Another facet could be telephone marketing. Another facet could be joint ventures or strategic mm -hmm. alliances. Another facet could be a different kind of direct selling right to the customer. Another facet could be joint ventures with manufacturers reps. Another facet could be contingency or shared revenue type selling with advertising mediums, radio stations, publications. So in other words, if, if now, if one of these pillars goes out... It's a nagging inconvenience, reason. but it maybe it'll annoy you and eliminate 10% of your, of your business, but it will not debilitate or, or terminate your, your ability to exist That's or subsist. It's fascinating because I, my business career started out with my desire to share ideas that I thought would make a difference in people's lives, and it started out with one avenue, which was one-on-one -on -one consulting working with people and then gradually it grew into the seminars and then gradually I began to realize I've got to have, if I'm going to have my, the goal really reached, I've got to have multiple ways to impact people. So that's how we grew into writing books and I looked around at other people, they're just authors. I said, no, I don't want to just write books. I want to have access to be able to change people's lives through books and profit from that. I want to be able to do it through audio tapes. I want to use television as a source. I want to make sure airports are a source of that kind of avenue. I want to make sure I have some outside promoters. I want to build my own team. And it's paid, it's paid off. You yeah, told me I, have... I was a point in my career early on where I was totally dependent upon outside sources and some of those promoters went out of business, and that's why I built the company, because I said, I don't but ever saw, want to be But you saw firsthand this happening. Oh, it's amazing. But it's you so also painful. have another permutation. You could have started your business perhaps just working with people who had a bad habit they wanted to end. But now yeah. you appeal to a broad spectrum exactly, of different... Not only did I get multiple channels of distribution, but I said, I want to help people emotionally. I want to help them financially. I want to help them physically. I want to help the predominant, most important areas. I want to be able to help turn businesses around. So you're the personification of that. That's interesting. That's and, really interesting. And the, the most important... I, I just, it gives you... Uh, the thing I can say to those listening is it gives you unbelievable certainty about the future because that's real security isn't it? I mean it? it's unbelievable because there's no you have so much critical mass you have so many ways to have a value to people's lives you don't ever have to be concerned about well can I do this successfully or what if something happens and so people look in a comment because I got I'm gonna predetermine a question people are probably thinking to themselves what an expense au contraire I approach every pillar as what I'll call an innovative profit center okay. you should never do anything that doesn't produce a profitable outcome for you, that doesn't basically dovetail together, that doesn't reinforce and make everything else right. you do even stronger. Synergistic. Synergistic, exactly. So when you do that, that's what gives you this incredible... Let's give some people some examples. Give us some examples with some businesses that had the diving board metaphor. They had one basic pillar holding them up, and you helped them to build a Parthenon of strength and uh, well, endurance. Can I tell you how profitability. We, I'll tell you how we grew back in, in the high inflation days. Uh, precious metals were, were a very popular hedge, and I did a lot of work with people there. I can tell you we grew a company from $300,000 in sales to a half a billion in 18 months. That might be interesting. That might be fascinating. Let's try that. <laughs> okay. I had a company that basically had no formalized marketing whatsoever. All they did basically was they had a relationship at that time with a small newsletter who occasionally recommended them. And whenever they made a recommendation, their phones would sort of ring and they would get business. And it was enough to keep the doors open. I saw that they were a very qualitative firm. They gave very good advice. They were understated. They dealt in what's called fiscal delivery, which is a very, very clean and a very ethical way of transacting business. You got the goods. They didn't hold them for you. It was not a dangerous way to buy. So I set out to identify the most safe and logical ways to grow their business exponentially and build many pillars. The first thing I did was they sold gold and they sold silver and they sold rare coins. But if you bought one, they just sort of dropped you. So the first thing I thought was what's the logical dynamic that happens in a selling situation? I'm going to go through the whole, the whole context. If you buy 
gold from somebody or any investment, unless you're really not very prudent, it's very rare that you make anywhere close to your capacity of investment initially. You want to see how the, the entity performs, the salesperson performs, and the investment medium performs. You're not going to give all your money, in other words, basically. So I figured if we set our whole approach at understating and underselling, not overselling, and basically mm -hmm. not even allowing people to spend to their capacity, but but compelling them to spend less. Our goal should be first to get them comfortable and satisfied with the investment. Second, to sell them more of the investment. Third, to take them to a lateral investment. So we'd basically try to sell them a little bit of gold, then a little bit more. After that, we'd sell them a little bit of silver. It was a little bit, a little bit and more. And along the way, under-promising and over-delivering. Always under-promising and over, not promising in the world, but just promising it for a hedge. Not right. saying it could go up or down, but it, if it goes down, it's purpose. Giving it a different context, then you're going to get rich quick. Okay. The opposite. Not make money, but it was a counter-investment. And we basically performed, and we delivered, and we were honest, and we were understated. All the while, we educated. We went out and we bought all kinds of material that gave very well-balanced, objective perspectives, not always good perspectives, and we did this. Okay, as I'm doing that, I'm getting greater residual value out of my customers. That was the first pivot. In other words, you're going back to those three things you talked about, mm -hmm. optimizing a business or growing yeah. a business. Because that's the easiest source of increased capital you've got in any business is your satisfied past customers. Getting them buy again or again buy again. more of. Right. right, so we did that. Then we went back to the first and the only source of business, which is one newsletter. They had occasionally, not formally, implicitly, explicitly endorsed us, but not on a concerted, systematized manner. Okay. So only because no one asked them. I went to them and I said, well, do you believe our company is good? And they said, yeah, you're the best. Do you trust us? Yes, we have impeccable faith in your integrity. I said, well, then let's, so people don't make a mistake and get buried by somebody else. Let's formalize this. So I set up a program where every time a new, a new subscriber came in, they got a new member kit that told them that we were the recommended dealer and they gave them a buying advantage and they gave them information. I set up a regular four time a year insert in their newsletter that promoted us. Once every six months, we mailed externally an endorsed letter for them and a direction to action. That was the first thing. That worked masterfully, massively in fact. When that worked, I thought, hmm, should we be satisfied with one or should we replicate it? So I went out systematically and set up relations with all kinds of other people. So you began to leverage, just like we talked about earlier. Cookie cutter. Then I went and I decided, I studied why don't people buy gold or silver or precious metals? And I realized they were afraid. They were afraid they'd make a mistake, they'd get burned. So I went and I started making offers for people to try. And when I tell you this, it's really cute. We sold millions of dollars of rare coins with a simple process that's so wonderfully delightful. I loved it. We took silver dollars back when silver dollars were very popular, and they were, our wholesale cost of them was about $21. I sold two Morgan silver dollars that cost me $21 for $19 as part of a test. And I, I did letters and I did ads, and they basically said, this was, a, this was another pillar. It basically said, too many people are trying to get you to spend five or $10,000 on an investment form or a collectible form that may or may not be right for you. We don't think that's correct. We think you should first get comfortable. You think you should study for yourself privately you know, the case, the investment. So we went out and we bought $100 worth of research reports, all kinds of interviews with all kinds of respected, unimpeachable experts, but we were able to reproduce them in mass quantity for like $3. Right. And we paid just royalties for them. So we gave them $100 worth of information that was unduplicatable, including interviews with people who thought gold, silver, and rare coins stunk because we wanted to be balanced. We wanted to make their own. Great. We gave them the rationale historically. We gave them an Austrian school of economics perspective. We gave them the downside, the upside, and we sent them two coins because we felt you couldn't understand why all the interest unless you held them in your hand. You mm -hmm. saw the, all the historic significance. You thought about what happened back 100 years ago. You saw the unbelievable mystical effect silver could have in your hand. Then we said, take 15 days and decide if this, the investment is right for you. If it is, we would hope, reading everything that's been said and also a lot of the testimonials, because we've got lots of people to talk about our integrity, you'd favor us. If you don't, you have two choices. You can keep the coin because it's nice to have. If you don't want to keep it, send it back to us and we'll give you $21, not the 19 you spent, because frankly, it cost us 21 wholesale. And we want you to be able to say that the one investment you made in rare coins, you made a profit. <laughs> I sold 100,000 people a, this is very, this just goes to the back, 100,000 people, and I'm going to be a little bit off because I can't remember the exact dynamics, a trial, $19 sale. Of the 100,000, approximately 10,000 bought from us at least $5,000 worth. Whoa. Of the, the 10,000, approximately 1,000 bought at least 
$10,000 more. Of the 1,000, approximately 300 bought at least fifty dollars to $100,000 more. Of the 90,000 that didn't buy originally, I was able to go back to and got another 10,000 over the year to buy again. And, it, and that one little gesture added about $10 million to our business. That's another pillar. At the same time, I went to all the book publishers and every great economics book that became out of print or, or didn't sell, I bought and I would distribute to people free with a letter that we thought that we think the investment in gold and silver or your outlook of the economy is so important that we wanted you to get a balanced opinion. So we bought this for you. There's no obligation. We hope only that you'll read Chapter 20 about precious metals. And if it makes sense, give us a call. We were doing that all the time. I went to Intergold, which then became the World Gold Council, which was the marketing conduit for Krugerrands before they outlawed them. I showed them that I had a better strategy for educating and compelling people to start owning gold. And, and you have to understand, back before they disallowed the Krugerrand, the Krugerrand was the most brilliant marketing strategy of them all. Do you know why? No. Because basically, whatever gold sold for, the Krugerrand sold for about 2 or 3% more. All it was was an innovative way that all the mines in South Africa came up with for getting a premium on gold by calling it something different and molding it. So they were making $150 million a year premium just on this form of selling gold. I got them to give us a million dollars for underwriting about 2 million 30-page brochures we sent out where we took two prominent economists who paid them each two grand for an interview. They had uh, contradictory sides, but they both agreed on precious metals. And we sent that out with their, and both of them happened to respect us. At the same time, I had offers for starter kits for gold. At the same time, I used direct mail. That's another pillar. Then because we got most of our business from when we brought in leads, a lead for investment can cost you 20 dollars $30, $50 a sure. piece. And then it's a deferred investment. You don't get back a profit for months sometimes. We found that our most viable form of lead prospect was a subscriber to a newsletter. So I went to all the newsletters, and most of the newsletter publishers were not back-end oriented. They weren't very astute in back-end. So I went to them, and whenever a newsletter promotion piece stopped making a profit, they would stop running it. We would take over running it at a break-even as long as they gave us joint tenancy of the names, they gave us absolute endorsement, they gave us inserts in their newsletter, they put us in their starter packet, so we, instead of losing $25 on a lead, would start breaking even and making a profit. And I had like dozens of these things happen concurrently, and they all coalesced. And the total for the business again was what? Well, it, it, it got in its peak year. It went from 300000 to $500 million in 18 months. <laughs> now, I should tell you, it's a little misleading. We only made about $25 because it's a low-margin business, but it was very profitable. Interesting, interesting. Is that well, a good those, enough example? Uh, I think it's a fairly good example. So it's basically not being content. If I had just basically <laughs> contented myself, and I made $2 million from the transaction, so I should tell you, if I had contented myself with only operating the one pillar they were doing, I would have made on my variable compensation literally about $2,500 that year. So it was a, it was, the difference was, what, 100 times? Amazing. It was easier to do, and it was harder to kill the business. I stopped working with them, and those programs, you talk about critical mass and velocity, they kept working for them for two and a half more years before they had to replace them. A lot of people listening right now are thinking, this is fascinating. I think some people say, well, gosh, you know, you gave them the coin. That's the puppy dog clothes. You know, they had it in their hand. They were stuck there. You know, you're inducing reciprocation. You're, but, you know, the truth of the matter is that you can pick all the stuff apart. What's most fascinating is the intensity and passion in which you've hit all of them. In other words, you're figuring every single tool and how do you maximize. You're coming back to optimization. So maybe you should describe again, what is optimization? And let, let's also see if we can now relate to somebody who doesn't own a business who right now yeah. might be in trance going, this is really wonderful, but I don't own a business. I work for somebody else. How do we make that happen? First thing is optimization, in my mind, is the process of getting the maximum yield for the maximum duration of time from the minimal investment, from everything you do today, in the future, and this is really interesting, from everything you've ever done in the past. And from everybody you, every, everybody and everything you ever come in contact with, not just your business, your current and your past employees, your vendors, your current customers, people you don't sell, suppliers, distributive lines, your location you're at, everything. So start with that premise. Here, here, here's a quick summary take on my, on my theory. Until and unless you can form a clear and distinct and accurate picture of what your vision 
for the business has to look like at the end. And I don't mean when you die or when you sell it. I mean when you get to wherever you're trying to go. Right. Until you have that clear and defined and not abstract, not just successful. Precise outcome. Exact. Precise outcome. You can't possibly build or fulfill or achieve your dream for that business. And the trick or the secret to building your vision is to master this art of optimization. Optimization is learning how to maximize, not minimize every asset. And keep in mind, the greatest assets you have in your business are not on the books. They are intangible. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Every contact, every opportunity, every relationship, every distributional channel, every employee, every piece of capital or human capital you have. Most people I have observed minimize instead of optimize. And right now, the business you know, environment demands this. This is why we're seeing companies that are downsizing, that are re-engineering the corporation, saying, let's look at every part of our business and figure out how to do it more efficiently than we've ever done it before. Exactly. Most people don't even identify or recognize all the areas or opportunities or options or pillars, as you say, for optimization that are available to their business because all they have as a point of reference is what they do in their business, this tunnel versus funnel vision. You can't optimize until you first recognize the assets, the opportunities, and the options available. If you don't know what's possible, you can't be expected to do it. So you've got to, first of all, stop and say, what is possible? How many better and other and additional ways could I be doing something that would work as pillars in my business? So part of why people bring you in is because you tend to see or have multiple ways of looking at something like that based upon your background of working with so many different types of businesses and so many different types of industries. I give it a CAT scan perspective based on a much broad knowledge base. But people could also, just, just to be fair because our outcome in this tape is also to uh, certainly have people utilize your resources where appropriate but also for them to realize that if they just start with a belief system well, that's that there are hundreds of other ways to do it, it, it instead of continuing oh, doing yes. it over and over again because what they're doing is working at a certain level just like the ad or not working that there are those other ways if I'll, they don't change that mindset it seems like nothing else really matters you're getting ahead of me but that's exactly true you must learn, learn what strategies allow your business to take best and maximum advantage of the greatest opportunities you have and again this is part of this understanding and this this acknowledging an awareness of how many other possible ways other people, other businesses outside your industry operate. I call this forming for yourself an optimal success strategy. And you can't forge an optimal success strategy until you first develop, as you said, a different philosophy to operate your whole business and life by. Well, let me clarify something now, this though. There are many things in your business which are not, they don't provide the maximum return, and yet all these small little returns. Well, it's an integrated big, comment. Let uh, me, you're right. Okay. It's like Deming said something. It's like certain parts of an enterprise may give their life for others. It's not. You can't be judged out of context. It's an integrated statement. Okay. In other words, I've had businesses where we purposely acquired new customers at a loss because we had analyzed the residual or the lifetime sure. value, and we knew that every time we lost, like the Icy Hot example, right. $5, we really made $500. Right. Every time we gave a free service, we didn't really lose money. We accrued an incredible benefit. So you got to look at it in an integrated either a holistic or totalistic context. Right. Okay. So you got to form an optimal strategy. You can't do that till you develop a whole different philosophy to operate not only your business but your life by because it forces you to be totally externally focused, totally, I'm going to use the word, service or benefit to others focused. And people have to realize that whether it's avaricious or not, the most self-serving thing you can do is to learn to be selfless serve others and, and no matter what you do to try and serve others and help others. And subordinate totally to your own needs. Right. Okay. So you can't forge a better philosophy until you first change, and this is where you're brilliant, your mindset replacing blocks and impediments and limiting beliefs with empowering ones. Right. Basically, you, people don't realize you're not playing the game for the moment. Exactly. You're playing it for forever. And when you look at it in that context, see, I, I've seen these very shallow thinkers think they're really astute because they made a little more profit up hmm. front, but they basically totally eliminated the residual effect. And the residual value is where all the wealth in life comes from. And I think the ultimate residual value is the identity that you create in the marketplace. I agree. Because what people know about you and believe about you and what you do for them is what's going to ultimately give you the leverage to do whatever you want to do in your life. And you can't replace identity. So what, a lot of what you're saying in terms of being selfless is when you give that much value to people's lives, it builds an identity which makes people want to do business, tell other people about business, whether you're the realtor or whether you're icy hot, whoever it is in terms of the business. I want to come back to one thing, and I, I may have interrupted your flow. If Doesn't I have, matter. let's come back to it. 
let's talk about this in terms of a person who doesn't own a business, because I've talked about this several times, but I don't think we've really addressed it. How does a person build more pillars? How do they optimize? How do they really build a greater sense of certainty for their future by using these same principles? How do we put them in a position either within the company where they have multiple ways of being valuable to the company, so the company's not going to down... I mean, when a company looks to downsize, they're looking at employees and they're looking from the perspective of who's adding the most value. Who can they afford to eliminate? Who can't they? But That's it's not only who is, who do they see as adding value? Yeah, now we're getting down to what marketing is. So let me ask you two questions. Question one, finish optimization, but then tell me, what is marketing? Give us your definitions as this whole topic has been about it. And then secondly, how do we use optimization and marketing if we don't own a business right now, to have greater leverage in terms of our sense of certainty Great. about our future. Okay. You want me to finish this? Yeah, go ahead and finish that first. Okay. Um, where was I? <laughs> oh, no, no, we were, talking, we were talking about increasing or over, overcoming limiting beliefs, so it's right. great. All right. You can't adopt a superior mindset until you def redefine the purpose and objective of your business from a customer or client benefit perspective. In other words, most people in business they lost from the beginning. They're a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're mediocre in success and in fulfillment because their purpose is incorrect. It's erroneous. You've got to basically set yourself up to understand what is the best and the highest and the most distinctive and the most valuable result or benefit or purpose my service or my company or my value added to that company or service can bring to you, the customer. Until and unless you understand and then redirect and refocus all your company's activities towards that outcome, you aren't going to get exponential. Well, most businesses, again, are tending to focus on how to make a profit versus how do they serve the customer in the greatest possible way and the most profitable way. But they way. think but it's because they erroneously think that those are separate. They're not. They, they are absolutely the same function. Anyhow, you can't redefine your business's highest and best purpose until you decide to innovate, in my mind, because in its purest sense, innovation is the bringing or the adding of superior value to the end user. It doesn't matter. If you innovate in your factory, it's useless if it doesn't bring an advantage to the end user. Right. You may have a so it might bring a price advantage to the end user potentially. Well, well that, but that's fine. Okay. But if it doesn't, a lot of times people do things, but they don't pass the advantage on to the customer. So I guess they think that they're basically uh, making more profit. But sooner or later, if you don't bring an innovation-based benefit on a continuous basis to your customer, you won't keep their patronage. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. You can't add value to someone, or someone can't see you adding value until and unless they understand and appreciate what you're doing, what you've done, what you will do differently, more beneficially for them, and that requires better marketing because, Tony, in its purest sense, marketing is two things. It's the continual educating of a customer or prospect for the life of that customer on the advantages and benefits and self-serving to them results your company or your service brings them that no one else does or can or will and it's the intelligently formulated process of increasing their demand or desire for your product or service and finally it's the strategic process of bringing them to closure and to completed action. So what we're really talking about marketing is, I like the definition you said, it's a lifelong process with the customer because that presupposes we're going to have an ongoing relationship. But it's educating them as to what's the, what do they get by working with us versus anybody else, and then the process of using that education to increase their desire for our product. Is that it? Well, not only their desire, but their appreciation. It's giving them, giving, it's giving them a basis to discriminate in your behalf. Interesting. Very interesting. So let's come back again to the individual now. How does an individual who doesn't own a business optimize or really build a Parthenon, if you will, for their financial life, for their business life, for their career? It's, it's very simple the moment you believe it's simple. All you got to do is put yourself in the position of your employer. Your employer is as scared as you are. Your employer, if it's privately owned, it's a man or woman or a group of investors who have sunk enormous amounts of capital and human capital into it. They are very eager to see that investment continue to pay out. They are hopeful it'll pay out long enough they can retire. They probably are very eager to see it pay out long enough they might even be able to sell it. As soon as you help give them their outcome, 
they will love you, treasure you, and never want you to leave. How do you do that? By identifying greater, more effective ways they can make their enterprise throw off greater profit. They can get more customers from the action. Just doing the same thing I suggest that any business owner do, but do it as a de facto business owner. Identify what they are. First of all, figure out how many other, better, more effective ways you can get customers. You can convert prospects to customers. You can increase the unit of sale. You can increase the frequency of sale. Other things you can do with customers or with, or with prospects who are inactive. When you've identified what those are, Go to your employer, and because you'll find once you understand these, they are so much more powerful by and large than anything your company is doing that the moment or within a few weeks or months of implementing them, they bring such advantage to your business that you don't want to necessarily reveal them to your employer until you affect the right structure. You go to your employer and- <laughs> I assume that means economic structure for your added value. That's right. And I'm giving you both sides of the transaction okay, great. in this interview. Great. You go to your employer and you make them a very simple proposition. You ask them if on your own time, you are able to identify, to, to organize, to implement in the most conservative manner so it's no threat to the company. No risk. No risk to the company. Processes, mechanisms, activities, efforts that will increase massively the amount of profit, sales, et cetera, that company gets in keywords are all of them will augment. They will never supplant the business activities, the customer uh, activities. It will only bring increased you're, you're value. Adding, you're adding more pillars, not taking away what yeah. they're already doing, right. which they're committed to right. and, and believe right. is the essence of their business. If I can do that for the company, can I, if it makes a lot of money, can I get back a dime or a quarter for every dollar I make you? And if that's too rich, can I get back a nickel or a dime? And if that's too rich, can I get back an extra $5,000 every time I make the company X for as long, this is the key, for as long as it keeps working? Huh? And would you mind putting it in a simple letter for me, sir? Or ma'am, as the case may be? It's all about adding value. And again, if you're doing that continuously, and even if you, in some cases, some people might choose not to ask for compensation, but just add the value so that it become invaluable to the company. But that's only one, yes, that's why I'm gonna get a little, little sexier with it, if I may. <laughs> Well, you do it Please right. Please do, Jay. You are so sexy. What can no, I say? No, it's, it's a pretty interesting you concept. You beast, you. No, you, it's a pretty interesting <laughs> concept because the, the basic premise is presuming and assuming you're going to bring things in. But that's only, it's, it's, think of it as a dual valve because you can export things too. Most companies, if you look at any business, we talk about processes, almost every business has at least one in multiple aspects of it where their processes are more effective, more powerful, more profitable, more efficient, more productive than anything else in their industry or in similar industries, cases in point. Certain companies have got their manufacturing structure down where they get greater efficiency per hour or per manpower or per 100 square feet. They get less wastage. They've got greater ways to do things. They have greater tax advantages. You can take those techniques that are being used internally and you can license or sell or rent those to other people outside of give your- Give us an example. Well, I'll give you two examples. I had a car wash one time. The guy was, came to me to try to improve his sales. In looking at his operations, I realized that his process of getting people to take the hot wax and all the other options was about three times better than almost any other car wash in, in the country. And I said, why don't you sell that technique to other people? And he reluctantly tried and he ended up getting a thousand car wash facilities to pay him. I think it was like $100 a month to use his way of articulating the option of the, the wax so that like, three times as many people took the wax option. That was all yeah. profitable. I had a realtor one time who who was, she was a very hot realtor who sold three offices to a big like Caldwell Banker or, or Remax or Century 21 and she was great at listing. She was great at listing. And she was sitting on her thumbs trying to figure something to do after she sold her business and I got her to take the techniques she used to list and teach other people outside of the, and, and she, the first one she did, she made $60,000 in three days teaching people at $1,000. Uh, do you want more? <laughs> I mean, I've got, I, but I've, but so the point is, within your company, if you look at the way your company operates, chances are every company, they've never thought about this because it's just the way they do business. 
they either sell better. They have ads that maybe they don't even use anymore that pull better on average than the industry norm. They have better closing mechanisms. They have a higher frequency of repurchase, a higher unit of sale. They operate the manufacturing facilities more effectively, more profitably, with less downtime, with less wastage. They get greater yield per employee or per dollar or per hour. They have greater, more efficient delivery. They have a lower or higher what's called CSI or Customer Satisfactory Index. They've got They've developed techniques that give them legal tax loopholes they don't know about. All of those processes can be standardized and can be sold or licensed or trade or leased or contingency made access to people for monthly fees, for buyouts, for percentages. You can do that for your employer and set up a profit center that can make tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, and you can set yourself up with the right proposition and the right structure and the right signed agreement to get that revenue residually forever, even if you quit your job. Does Fantastic. that make sense? It makes total sense. I mean, that's just one way, but there's tons of ways you can, and, and you, can, you don't have to do it there. You can do it also for other people. You can buy and sell concepts. You can be a brokerage firm. I mean, so the idea is how many more ways can you make, and by the way, I'm talking predominantly in a money making. I'm just giving the one aspect of your company. There's a flip side. How many ways can you get your company more efficient? Because their idea of downsizing is very limited. Most entrepreneurs don't have the slightest understanding of all kinds of ways to reduce their cost, to improve their productivity. And I was just talking in the first segment of this interview about ways to increase sales. Well, the flip side, there's all kinds of things. If you just improve such things as if you reduce attrition, which is the loss of customers, or conservation, which is the retention of customers, a 10% reduction in loss, and most people don't even measure how many customers don't come back, but it's if you look at your inactive customers, how many new customers come, how many buy this year, how many didn't buy that were on, on the customer list last year, that alone can increase your sales. All you do is look at other ways you can bring your employer improvements, efficiencies, reductions that they wouldn't have done on their own, and you can ask for percentages of savings, of increased productivity. You can ask for bonuses. You can ask for that residually and not tie it to your job. And with a few simple phrases uttered on paper and signed, they can downsize you and terminate you and you can still get a residual check for life. And what I've done with a lot of people when they did that was teach them to go to the employer and get a buyout. Interesting. Oh, that's a great So they get a lump sum. Oh, that's wonderful. So in other words... Which they can maybe start a new business with. That's right. Or get the employer to fund things. For them, or give them space, or give them capital, or joint venture with them. It's all kinds of things you can do. It just takes it takes the ability to, what the Australians coined it, step outside the box, move right. outside your paradigm. Maybe a good example of that that I remember she shared with me was an example where I think you were talking to someone about the customers they weren't getting. They'd run some advertisement and people had not bought their product or service. And you turned around and said, well, that's a great opportunity. If they've not bought, they're not necessarily going to buy from you, but they're going to buy from somebody. Why not sell that to your competitors? Uh, you're, you're even figuring out how to maximize or optimize the people that don't buy from you. Let's talk about that and, how, and relate that to, if you would, you know, thinking outside the box, so to well, speak. Well, let's talk about upside leverage and optimization for a minute. People are limiting their, if, even if you understand what you think I said, you tend to think about it only in the context of your business. Think okay. about it in the global expanse that there's all these people who don't have a clue what they're doing, business owners, competitors if you will, complementary people and competitors who are spending enormous amounts of human capital and money bringing in prospects, bringing in customers, and you are too. So I believe that one of the greatest areas of opportunity and optimization and profit is in the people people don't sell. I did a seminar one time, made $200,000 on this. I was selling a training program to put people into a certain kind of business. I went through Entrepreneur Magazine and saw two or three other people who had a similar training program. I went to them and asked them if they would let me furnish them with a letter they would send to their existing people who paid to go to their training. They refused, both of them. I said, fine. You have prospects who inquired and didn't convert? They said, sure, we got tons of them. I said, great. Will you sign a letter to them saying, in essence, this, we were gratified when you inquired. We were sad and you didn't take advantage of our training, but we realized there must have been one of a few reasons. Either the timing wasn't right, it was too expensive, or the opportunity didn't work for your skill set. If you're still wanting to go in business for yourself, there's only one other person we think might help you, and they recommended me. 
and I made $200,000 by getting them because I said those people didn't respond because they weren't interested in going in business. You either didn't have the right compelling offer, you didn't make the right proposition, your concept was wrong, your approach was wrong, your people were wrong. But they, were, they raised their hand for a reason. Right. I can give you more, but does that help you? <laughs> yes, it does. So that's part of thinking outside the nine dots. What makes you think the way you do, Jay? I mean, what is it in your background? Tell us a little bit, you know, how do you become the marketing guru, per se? Where do you get this thought process that you have? I mean, now I understand you've had so many exposures to so many different businesses, but where did it start? I'd really be curious. Um, what well, started, it started very accidentally. I said to you earlier, I had a background being an absolute business transit. I've done so many unrelated things in my life. For example, I was a cost accountant. I sold uh, electric shavers. I leased trucks for Hertz. I sold radio advertising. I ran and sold dry cleaning uniform rental, and I bet you don't know what dust control is, do you? <laughs> No, I don't. So in the Midwest, you rent mats and mops to wipe people's feet in businesses so they don't traipse it over there. It's a very lucrative business. We did uniform rental. I was in the sway cleaning. I was in the eight-track stereotape duplication business. I was in the real estate business. I was in the affinity travel business. I was in the association business. I was in the patent medicine business. I was in the chemical business. I can go on and How on. Did, these were jobs? Some of them were jobs, some were part-time, some were joint ventures. I said I was basically, I had two kids when I was 20, and I, had, I have no college education, and I had to basically use my ingenuity and my agility. And sometimes I'd have, one time I had three full-time jobs. No one knew it, they were all selling, and I made, made big profits at all of them. Because I always learned to deal with results, not time. Right, so what you did is rather having salaries at those times, you got a percentage Everything of was variable. Out of value. But what I realized, when I would leave a job, most people have a period of their life where they have an experience and they do something, then they go to, a lot of people go to a totally unrelated field and they sort of turn off, they sort of compartmentalize and they relegate to the catacombs of the dusty past everything they've learned. I had this tendency to say, what did I learn about that situation that made sense? And I'll go back, for example. When I was in um, a cost accountant, I learned the lowest allowable cost of something. And I thought, what? that's interesting. When I sold shavers, I learned about co-op advertising. I learned about selling, that even though you had distributors, they never bought if you didn't sell through to a retailer. So dealing with distributors was almost a nuisance because they would not buy a lot unless you gave them orders. So you had to sell the end user. I learned that purchases weren't always made based on the viability. It was other things you gave them. For example, I'll tell you a funny story, how I sold $200,000 worth of shavers in Indianapolis at Christmas time. I was very curious. Most people need to be more curious. And curiosity and discovery is an external process. It doesn't occur if you stay limited myopically to what's going on in your industry. I studied everything and I learned that um, Billboard companies selling billboards, normally no one bought billboards from December the 15th to January the 15th. It was a dead time, and most everyone who bought up till then got free advertising through then, and the billboard companies hated it, but there's no buyers. Well, I also learned that in, in shaver advertising, you accrued co-op. You bought something, and the manufacturer would give you a, a matching funds based on certain purchases that they would pay 50 cents on, you paid 50 cents up right. to a certain dollar. But most people didn't use it because the, the manufacturers had what I'll call tombstone ads that didn't sell, and most people didn't use it and it dissipated, and if you didn't spend it, it accrued back to the manufacturer. I was the district sales manager for the city. I realized there was a lot of accrued, unused co-op advertising. That was point one. Point two, I realized there were all these billboards that weren't paid for, that weren't being used in all these unhappy billboard companies. I went to the billboard companies and ended up to make a deal. I bought $200,000 worth of billboards for $10,000 cash because they were chagrined at all these advertisers who took advantage of them. I took the $200,000 worth of billboards, went to the biggest drug chain in Indianapolis, offered them $200,000 worth of billboards if they'd buy $200,000 worth of shavers. Oh my gosh. They were excited, but I really, they would earn, the $200,000 of the shavers would have earned them $20,000 worth of co op. So I ended up saving $10,000 on our co op al allocation in the process. <laughs> but it's, I, I learned various things as I went along. When I did IC out, I learned not only that you can get advertisers to accept performance instead of uh, just a rate card, but I learned the value of the residual sale. I learned don't pay for advertising, pay for results. I learned to develop the back end. When I was in the lead generating business, I learned the four, you want to know, you know the, the, the four critical factors of generating a lead that no one knows about? Oh, that sounds like a good idea. It, it is. It, it's, it's very, it's very <laughs> fascinating. Most people don't understand. Everyone generates leads. A yellow page ad, a phone call is a lead, somebody you meet. Leads have four critical factors. What they cost is only one. 
The conversion rate is the second factor. The unit of sale is the third factor. And the residual value is the fourth. Until you know all four of those factors, you don't know anything. People say, well, yeah, our leads cost us $25 or a new customer cost us $50. And that doesn't matter. What matters is what do they bring in the first sale? How often do they come back? What's the profit on them? Right. Until you analyze all those, a lot of people who generate leads, look at, they don't even analyze them, but the few that analyze them, they standardize them all together. They say, well, a lead costs us 25 bucks, but you may have a lead coming from one source that cost you 100 that's 10 times more valuable than ones that cost you five. Right. I learned all these things. I learned so many things. I became like the opening of the $6 million man. Do you remember that where they show the, the matrix or they show the grid where they got, they got the computer things going <laughs> sideways and down and crisscrossing? I that's start, what your brain looks like. Well, now. it is. When I look at something, I don't it's, it's, gotten, it's gotten to be automatic pilot. In right. the beginning, I disciplined myself to say, how many better ways? How many other ways? What have I learned from other people that could be applied? That's what I did. I did that consciously. Now, automatically, I look at it and it's a ch 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 You have so many circuits you've already wired up for And every yourself. time I work with another group, because you, you I don't... add to the references and yeah, distinctions. Well, sure. because I change. I Basically, I do something no one else does. I don't conduct my programs. I make the participants conduct the programs. And as such, I learn as I'm teaching right. and all that's stored away. And every time I learn a new way, I learn how somebody else uses my techniques. I learn techniques I have and I just file them away. And then I standardize them and categorize them now under the, the distinctions of these three ways to grow a business or the other, uh, the other categories. And it just sort of becomes natural, but it's not as complex. It can be taught very easily as, is, as attested to the, the hundreds or thousands of people that have been able to successfully use it. Well, part of it, is, I know you're a Power Talk listener as well, and the, one of the most popular ones we've had is the power of questions. And really, thinking is nothing but the process of asking and answering questions. And you've asked questions that have helped you to take all these experiences, these references, and turn them into active, usable technology distinctions, things that can improve the quality of life. So I know you've often said that in business, People rarely, I don't think you say rarely, I think you say people just don't ask the right questions. What are the right questions we need to ask ourselves consistently in our business? Well, okay, about your business. Where is your business coming from? Most people have never analyzed the origin of their business. And it's a two-pronged question. Where new people are coming from and where repeat business is coming from because this is trite, but the 80-20 rule is probably true probably 20% of your customers are bringing you 80% of your business, but you're not treating them special in two ways, acknowledgement or offering them more. If you know that one kind of a customer has a tendency to buy more often and higher tickets, you can program them to even more purchases. You can offer them products and services that not normally would be offered because they're too expensive to stock or produce. You might find, it's like in realtors, it's funny, I analyze them and they, they knock on doors and they run ads and they do referrals and they do this, but when I ask them to go back and analyze regressively where the origin is, they'll find that 80% of their new business came from one or two categories and yet they're not discriminating. They're spending the same or less time on those categories than they do on the rest. So the one thing is you can't optimize till you'd put the greatest effort and the great, you know, the idea is getting the best, highest best use of your time and your opportunity. Where do you get the best leverage on yourself and your business? I think you ask lots of questions and you keep going deeper and you ask as specifically as you can. So give me an example when you say going deeper. What's your organizing principle for going deeper? Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, I interviewed a number of realtors one time and they were very successful. They're, they're top 2% in the industry. And I said, well, what's your primary mode of selling? And they all said, referral selling. And I said, well, that doesn't mean anything. And I said, well, tell me what that means. And I started going deeper. How do you get a referral? Well, I asked them to give me some. I said, well, what do you say? And they were startled. And I said, well, I never thought about it. I said, well, what do you say to them? I said, how do you get them? How do you position them? What do they say back? What happens then? What do you do after that? After you ask them that, if they don't do it, do you follow up? If they do do it, what do you do? If they do do it, do you go back for more? I just kept going deeper and deeper and okay, deeper. And the trick is to not it'd be very specific and challenge yourself to specificity, go deeper and deeper and deeper. Coming back to the, the, if you gave me three questions that every business person needs to ask consistently, you start out with the first one, which, which is where is the origin of my business? Where's it really coming from? Yep. What are the other two? Well, there's, there's a couple questions. All right, where, where is it coming from? Where could it come from? It's a similar mm, question. Most people have no idea where their highest and best source of new business is. I mean that in a geographic, I mean it in identificational, I mean it in, in an approach. Number two is who stands to benefit more than you by your being more successful? Hmm. Most people don't ask that. And that gives opens up to lots of possibilities. First of all, the customers, if you understand results. Second of all, suppliers, because sometimes you may be, relatively speaking, 
a greater beneficiary to a supplier than, I mean, they, you may be 80% of their business. They be more, more, may be more motivated to fund, to help, to support you in growing your business, to run ads, to co-op, to advance money, to hire or, or, or cooperate on sales people to bring in if you don't, you don't have the money or the interest in doing that. That's a great question. Number three, who's in a position who already has my customers and, and has already sunk an enormous amount of effort, time, money, and action to get their goodwill and would be in the perfect position to recommend, endorse, or make them available to me with a positive predisposition? I mean, I can give you lots more questions, but those are three good ones. Well, give me two more. You're going to have a major role here. Okay. What other ways can I benefit from the goodwill I have with my customers in an ethical and uh, beneficial manner to them? And one more. Okay. What ways can I better reduce the risk of the transaction, thereby mm -hmm. getting more people lowered in their resistance uh, barrier to take advantage of my product or service the first time? Ah, that leads me to a very important concept. Let's talk about risk reversal. How important is that? What is it? And how can virtually any business use it to see an improvement in their ability to bring customers to the table initially and then continue to play in the future? Okay. Well, first of all, how important is it? Well, do you want to stay in business and, and do you want to be competitively <laughs> superior and do you want to be obscenely wealthy and successful? So first of well, all... Well, that's set up. Okay. Understand this. In any business, well, any life encounter, but any business encounter, one side of the transaction is always being asked to assume all or more of the risk than the other. It may be done explicitly, it may be done implicitly, it may not even be consciously being done, but in every transaction that ever occurs in business and probably in life, one side is always being asked to take more of a risk than the other. To the extent you can recognize and acknowledge that fact and you can eliminate and reduce or even, even make better than risk-free, the transaction on the part of the prospective customer you're trying to induce to sample or avail themselves of your wares, you own the business. Let me give you an example because it's from the 19th century and it's, it's a wonderful little story. A man wanted to buy a horse for his daughter. There were two horses for sale. One man said to him, buy the horse, take it home. If you don't like it, bring it back and I'll give you back the money. The other man, who understood risk reversal said, my horse is kind, gentle, good, but I, I would say that it's my horse. Why don't we do this? Let me bring the horse to you. Let your daughter ride the horse for 30 days. I will even bring you the oats for the horse. I will come and send my son to clean up the debris the horse drops for the 30 days. At the end of that time, you decide whether the horse is suitable for your daughter. If it is, I will come then and ask to be paid. If it is not, I will come then and take it away from you at my cost. Now, which would you buy? No question. Well, I mean, that's a little bit graphically maybe strained, but that's the essence. Whenever you can doubt, here's the irony. Every business really guarantees the transaction by and large because if there's a problem, they either make good on it or they give the money back or they give a replacement, but they sweep it under the carpet. I teach people to bring it to the top. Make it a condition, make it a powerful, very specific aspect of the selling transaction and not in the way of saying satisfaction guaranteed. That's like saying service, quality, dependability. I believe you denominate very specifically, you would call future pacing the outcome one should expect. You give somebody um, a matrix or a discriminator to impose on what their benefit, what their result should be. You tell them, look, Mr. Robbins, if this service doesn't make you 20% more, more effective. It doesn't reduce your this by 15%. If you don't sleep the happiest night you've ever slept, if you aren't more robust and healthy, if you aren't this, if you aren't that at the end of, of 30 days, and this is a trick, but it's an ethical trick, you have every right, if you like, to ask for your money back. Interesting. And it's a very powerful way. I believe in giving a better than risk-free proposition than most of my transactions. Basically, I want to make it, so, remember I told you about the coin where if you send it back, you get to keep, I didn't say you get to keep the $100 worth of, of information, but you also get a $2 profit. Right. I want someone to be benefited so that at very worst, they come out advantaged for, for having at least taken a risk. They come out protected, advantaged, ahead of the game. And what is your belief that guides that process? What's your belief about people and what they really need in that situation? Well, I believe two things. 
that there's two kinds of people in business. Well, there's three. The people who actually render an incredible service and know it but don't tell it. There are people who actually render a great service and don't know it and don't tell it. And there are people who don't render a very good service or product. Uh, the latter, you can't do much with. They're not going to endure because the market will find them out no matter what. Right. And a risk reversal or guarantee is only going to help them the first time. In the repurchase cycle of life, they're going to get found out and they're going to fall out. Because they're not adding enough value. Okay. But the vast majority of people either do or can easily render such a superior service or it can get their market to see them more distinctively or preemptively advantageous. But the only way to do that and make it easy is to, is to see, I think you acknowledge the fact that, hey, even though I know that what I do for you, let's use J. Abraham's service, even though I know what I do for you is going to produce a great outcome, it's going to make you more profits, it's going to reduce your, your, your expenditures, you're going to spend less, you're going to make more, you're going to have more fun, you're going to build more net worth. You don't know that. Even though I tell you 3,500 people who have experienced it, you for yourself don't know it. So I see it as my job, as my charge, as my responsibility, Mr. Robbins, to allow you to avail yourself of it, to preview it, to experience it totally at my risk. Why? Because if it works the way I say, you're not going to want to not continue, so I'll be benefited. If it doesn't, I don't deserve to keep your money anyhow, and that's the basis that I operate on. Now, it's an interesting, interesting principle because uh, I had a meeting recently with a gentleman named Joe Carey from Good Times Video. And they are the number one video producer in this country now in terms of actual gross number of units, not gross volume. I think Disney's a little bit higher than they are. They sat down with Walmart and said, we want to put you in the video business. And they said, here, Walmart, here's what we'll do. We'll come in and do a great job for you. We'll sell you a video for $10 and you can sell it for 15 And Walmart came back and said, no, you don't understand our business. You'll sell it to us for five, and we'll sell it for ten. You'll send it to us, and you will not charge us. We will not give you a penny until we sell it. It'll basically be on consignment. You will pay for the space in which you place it. Not only that, but you will guarantee us a certain number of sales in that area by contract. And if we don't sell a product, you will pay not only for the shipping to get here, but you'll pay for us to ship it back to you. So Walmart has a bit of leverage in a relationship. Now, when they first but they this, also know that they're going to sell a lot of units for people. Because they're whatever the number of people it is that go through a Walmart store. It's an insane number. And actually, I think he told me it was 60 million in a, in a period of time. But anyway, the point of the matter is he came away and said, that's insane. We can't do that. There's no way to do that. This is, you know, we can't be profitable. It can't happen. But he kept thinking about those 70 million or whatever the number, actual number is that go through a Walmart store every day. And he said, you know, I could have trash in the front seat there and we're going to sell it if you've got 70 million people walking by it. So he began to think about this and he came back and, again, I, I don't remember the accurate number, but he represented to me that, that they went ahead and said, we're going to meet you on all these different levels and we're going to do more than that. We're going to put a space, since we're paying for the space, we want to design it because this is our expertise. We want to be able to come straight here and put it, not go through one of your buyers, but design how people are going to see these videotapes, when they're going to be there. We want to restock them directly. I mean, the long and the short of it is, they, it cost them something like 10 or $12 million the first year, and they made no money. The second year, I think it cost them 7 or $8 million. This last year, which I think is their sixth or seventh year in relationship there, they, they made, made four, or excuse me, $500 million in business with a 25% net. And Walmart, not only have they serve Walmart so well, and they have the information technology, the POS technology, to know the minute a videotape is sold, they know what videotape it was, what store, the minute it occurs, so they can keep track of what's most popular and replace it immediately. But they serve Walmart so well that Walmart has given them all their CD-ROM business for the future. And Microsoft said they wouldn't, they wrote a letter to, I had a chance to sit down with um, Bob Walton, who's, you know, the son who's taken over Walmart. And they sent him a letter saying, we're not going to work through this Good Times video with our CD-ROM business. And they sent a letter back saying, well, you think we're crazy, but a lot of people thought Sam Walton was crazy also. These people know how to serve us, and if you want to do business with us in all of our stores, you have to go through them. So they have wrapped up that business by serving their customer. By doing, in, in essence, they were told what the risk reversal had to be. Yeah. Um, but they took it on, and they were willing to take what seemed like a loss in the short term because of the same principle you talk about. The back end it's, for them is don't realize hundreds it. of millions of dollars. Ask yourself this question. I'm going to get back because it's a great. It ties everything together. You have choices of buying a product or service from five vendors. Four of them basically don't even mention guarantee or are very nebulous. One of them not only mentions it, 
but insists that be a condition of doing business, insists you put them through the paces, insists that that be the only way they sell to you, helps you determine what your expectation minimally should be for you to be satisfied and get value. Which are you going to buy from? Now, people say, that's terrifying. I'm going to lose all my business if I do that. Well, because you can test anything small, and we'll talk about this in a minute, okay. and you can, you can find out the answer and the, the risk or the opportunity on anything, it, it's very easy to test a risk reversal and never be compromised. You try it two or three or four times, you see how it increases. Remember you talked about baseline and variance, how it right. increases your baseline figures, your sales, your closures. Then you wait until the uh, duration of time for, for the guarantee to expire and see what your incidence of refunds are right. or, or requests. But more right. importantly, the easiest way to do it is ask yourself this question. Does your product perform at the level you would promise? Most okay. of them do. Yes. If it does, most people, when given a clear, more finite picture of what to expect on a denominated performance basis, see even greater advantage, see even greater value than just you're going to feel better. If I say you're going to feel better, that's one thing. If I say, Tony, you're going to sleep like you've never slept before. Your face is going to look radiant. Your eyes are going to sparkle. You're going to have three more hours of, of energy. Your wife is going to think you're incredible in any way you want that to be interpreted. So all that, all, that comes, better. all that would come across to me as hyperbole until you say, and if these things don't occur... Within 30 days, as long as you do your part of whatever the regimen or the take the pill right. or, or follow the, 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 the... It's right. You've got to denominate it specifically. It's not, but, but most people don't tie it all together. You've got to really put your whatever on the line and be... But all you have to do is say this. What's my incidence of problems or refunds right this moment? And look and see what it is. Say, well, if that doubled, but my business doubled too, would that be a real problem? Because normally when you aggressively and powerfully and specifically and concertedly incorporate risk reversal into your selling platform, not just an aside at the end when there's a problem, but you bump it upstairs as part of the sales process you use, it will increase your closure rate massively. I can tell you, I have a client who's a founder of Federal Express. He used risk reversal and he increased his, his business quadrupled the first time he used it. I have another person who's the founder of the 33rd largest uh, accounting firm in the country. He tried it to get clients and it doubled his closure. And, and the incidence of refund or unraveling was nil, but it presupposes you don't do it if you don't perform a great service. You don't denominate an expectation if you don't deliver it. The other thing I think that happens, too, is when you make a demand upon yourself and the customer doesn't have to do it, they actually tend to probably soften on you more than get harder on you because they see that you're truly committed. They see the integrity in what you're that's operating a, within that's the business. Right. Um, this brings up another issue, which is really we've talked about earlier the importance of creating a unique identity in the marketplace. You know, so that when someone thinks of that particular product or service or that industry, they think of you ideally. How do you begin to do that in your mind? If, if you put a client here and they say, you know, we're one of many, and, and, and you can pick any industry you want or example you want, but we're right now one of many, how do we develop or create a unique identity rapidly in the marketplace? What would you tell them would be the steps to take? Well, first of all, I call that either unique selling proposition or unique selling advantage or unique selling distinction. And it's basically what people see as the benefit or the advantage you bring them more superior, more beneficially, more advantageously to their self-serving needs than anyone else. Depends on who you are. It's not a standard because it differs for different situations, okay. but it's a question of giving them what somebody else doesn't. And it can be a lot of things. Let's say you sell something hard versus something soft. Something hard is tangible. Something soft is services. Okay. Okay. If you sell something hard, you might throw something soft in with it free or very inexpensively to do it. You might double or triple the protection. You might do things that other people don't do. They'll appreciate you and the performance of your product at a much higher level. No question. And their, and their, and their loyalty will be enhanced so, I mean, just it's amazing. Tell me, as we wrap up here, let's get back to innovation for a second. You said you had a, a matrix for how to innovate, which is one of the primary ways to add value, create a mm -hmm. unique identity. Mm -hmm. What is that matrix that you've come up with? Well, it's a process of starting to look at and, and capture and document and extrapolate that which other people are using. And, and the easiest way to start is look at your own life. In your personal or your business life, what products or services have you purchased? 
and start they're not being abstract start Meaning consistently you've purchased it doesn't them, matter or? it doesn't matter if it's consistently or one time okay. just something that compelled you to buy it then having a matrix where you start asking yourself why did i buy it first of all okay so the next question is what about that desire motivated me was it performance was it start getting deeper and deeper what was I, what was the outcome or the result i was expecting number 2 how did they convey that to me number 3 what selling what closure what risk reversal what illustrative methods did they use to induce me and start asking yourself questions like that that's one part of the matrix the next part is every day of every week of every month of the rest of your life make it a point to visit call upon stop inquire from everybody you meet or know in business at least two or three people a day and ask them a couple of questions number one how do you sell your your product or service more specifically what's the most effective way your company has found to do it what do you find to be the elements that make your sell the easiest to express what is the selling philosophy you use what is the basis you close your sales what has impacted your selling strategy most then ask me just asking lots of questions and then asking yourself as you're getting this and documenting it what about that can I directly apply? Exactly. That's what I, you, how can I utilize this? Right. What about it? If I can't directly apply it, what about it? Could I indirectly apply? If I can't directly or indirectly apply about it, what could I? Who could? I, that's right. <laughs> who could? And then right. and ask yourself that. Then the final thing is take everybody in your field that is not a direct competitor. That means if you're a regional company, then, then make a list of everybody nationally who's not competing with you and call one of them every day and say, my name is Jay Abraham. We are not competitors. I will never be selling in Los Angeles. I'm in Chicago. If you're planning on selling in Chicago, please don't take my call. If you're not, I thought it'd be wise if we started a relationship where I shared with you what I've learned and what I do and compare it to you and ask you, what's the most successful selling technique you've done? What's the most effective relationship you've done? How do you guys do this? What is the most productive? And start, why should you recreate the wheel? Borrow from other people who've already done it. Next is if you then go to people who are in generically similar service businesses who do things not dissimilar. Then go outside and look at how other people totally and just pick people's minds. Asking questions, curiosity Consummate and investment. Well, right. no, yeah. but discovery in me, in my mind, discovery is the fuel of competitive advantage. And Ooh, you can't discover nice. internally. You that's gotta go nice. outside because Everyone in your business does things pretty much the same way. You don't want to know what your industry is doing, plus or minus 10%. You're already doing it. That's not where you talk about strategy. You had a comment, a, a parenthetical comment to me, which was accurate about if I don't change my strategy, I'm not going to get a different result. Well, it applies to these people too. No one in your industry is going to give you what you want. Everybody outside your industry is going to give you what you want because they've already stumbled accidentally upon all kinds of ways you can improve your business, all kinds of ways you can be more successful. They just don't know you want to know it. Ask them. They have nothing to lose by telling you, and they'll be so appreciative. Sometimes, if it's really important, I'll call somebody and offer them $100 for their time. None of them take it, but they're so flattered that somebody values them. They'll talk to you for two or three hours if you pick their mind. It's real easy. To, people make it so much harder than it has to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's a core belief system that you have that seems to guide everything. Discovery is the fuel of competitive advantage. I like that. That's wonderful. Tell me, if a person is looking for a business right now, let's say, for example, they work for someone else and they really want to start their own business or they want to get in business, then how would you guide them to evaluate the type of business they would want to be in and the type of business they would not want to be in? Well, and, and I think earlier you said to me that you have some tools for how would you guarantee most businesses fail. Yep. How would you guarantee that a business would succeed? First of all, is look to see what businesses have customers that they're not maximizing, that you could basically create a business which would be a joint venture relationship with them where you could take fullest advantage of the enormous investment they have already made, the enormous goodwill they have already established, the enormous money they are continually spending on facilities, on equipment, on personnel, on advertising, to sell or offer other logical extended products or services under the confines of the company. There's lots of, lots of examples, but basically you find products or services. Most businesses I look at sell one product or service. All they think of themselves in the context of, I sell this product. When in fact, the very acquisition of that product 
means that a customer has to have pre-done one thing and then post do something else to make usually that product work. It integrates with other products or services. Okay. All you got to do is say, what are the other products or services before and after they buy yours that they need or want? Find a way to make an association with somebody else who represents that. Come together with a company who sells one, do a joint venture with them, and you can make more money. Find somebody who's got a customer base and a great relationship, but they're only selling one facet of the process. Find other people who represent other needed aspects of the process. Make deals with them where you become their representative because you can deliver a market they don't have. Make a Based joint. on associations you yeah, have or that's a way to do it. Number, number two, if you want, if you're hell-bent on buying a franchise, don't buy the franchise until you do the following. First of all, talk to at least a dozen people who are unhappy. Talk to at least a dozen people who didn't buy the franchise. If the franchise people won't give you the names, then they probably don't have what they say because if they got what they say, they should want you to have a balanced look. Then before you buy it, get the yellow pages from 50 markets and look under the generic category and see if other people have a generic equivalent. Call them up and ask them if you could visit them for free or for a fee. After you visit and look at them, see if they've got something which is as good and ask them if you could pay them a little bit of money to consult with you. There's lots of ways to get there without, so you head yourself, you can model something more successfully. Finally, if you're gonna get into a franchise, most franchisees drop the ball on the most critical area. They don't give you marketing. They don't give you selling. They give you a system of operation, but you're on your own. Before you sign the dotted line, call at least 50 other franchisees and ask them to share with you the method they have of generating business. If they don't have a great method or combination method you can synthesize together, don't do it because at most you're going to buy yourself a job and make less money and you won't have anything you can sell. You've also said that you don't want people to buy a business that doesn't have a clear back end. That's right. So. If you don't, you're exactly right. He's telling me my own business, and I thank you for it because I'm getting <laughs> punchy too. But the truth of, if it's a one-shot sale, you're not buying anything. It's your promotion, not a business. You want something where when you invest in a transaction, you have enormous amounts of future transactions you can predictably depend on, and you should think not just in terms of selling your product, but selling all kinds of other products or services. Most people think of themselves as being a widget maker or a service company. I think of you as being an ethical opportunist, and by that I mean your goal is to find as many ways to optimize the selling opportunities you have to that customer. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. It's very powerful. Let me, let me bring you back just one step here oh, for people why? starting a business. What are the questions, because everybody can answer a question, that you would be asking entering a business to, to be able to create such a business as you've described? In other words, if I want to find a business, I want to find that need you're describing that I can fulfill. Okay, ask yourself in, this in question. In a joint venture type okay, of Okay, ask situation. yourself this question. If you're looking for a system, a company that basically has a selling system that works but isn't begun to be to be optimized. Right. You're looking for a company that has enormous goodwill with customers that on their own accidentally and automatically are repurchasing over and over again but aren't being programmed. You're looking for a company that has at least one and hopefully multiple f sources of revenue and that could easily adapt to multiple pillars that we're talking about. Okay, first thing I would do is with permission I would analyze the marginal net worth characteristics of the business. I would learn what's a customer worth. What predictably will they be worth? And then I'd ask myself this question. And you've got to learn, and I didn't really give you a great education this, but predictably, how many more ways can I extend the life of the customer? Because that's the surest way you've got to hedge. If you can't extend the life of the customer up and out, by that I mean for more money and more transactions okay. ethically and more times, then it's very dangerous. If you can do that, then you almost are certain that it's a good investment. How do you how do you answer that question in a way that's measurable or quantifiable? Is there a way? Do you have a system? Yeah, there is. First of all, you got to shop the business yourself. You got to ask permission in confidence, I guess if they're if they're the slightest bit apprehensive with the warrant that you'll give them a release or a confidentiality statement to call and talk to some of the customers as if you were a representative of the company. You've got to find out for yourself firsthand, not through conjecture, what the goodwill is, what the loyalty is, what they see as the benefit, how much more leverage you've got in them by asking trial balloon questions so you can see how many more products or services or programming you can do with that customer or whether their product or service are programmed out or whether they're loyal or disloyal. And it's a process you've got to go with. It. It's a laborious. Most people are too eager to spend their money and commit their fate and their destiny. To a, to a business they don't know yes. enough about, and yes. as a result, that's yes. why two-thirds of them are going to fail. That's right. 
Interesting. So to answer the question directly then, the way that you make a 90% success ratio is you fully analyze and understand how to move the customer. Not emotionally. Not emotionally. I you got it. Boy, that was pretty forceful. Well, because I was thinking, most people <laughs> make all their decisions from their heart. They have this vision of basically being a business owner. They have this decision of being happy. They have this decision of making money. And what they end up doing is creating a crumbling edifice that they can't even sell and they can't even then they have to run it and it ends up being it consumes them it's horrible or when they end up actually working harder than they ever did at a job for, for less money very often and, and, or going to life debt savings in the process. are compromised right so exactly. i have a philosophy on all businesses which i want to make sure i can share with you because it's really it's really important give, give it to us now whether jay abraham ever comes in your life or not you're the one who's consciously made the decision to invest your whole life perhaps you know the fate of your family, the fate of all kinds of other families who are dependent directly or indirectly on you. You're the one who's got your house maybe mortgaged. You're the one who's got to get up every Monday morning and be in there to open the door. You're the one that has to make payroll, clear the bank. You're the one that's got your, your name on the line for the real estate. You owe it to yourself to do a couple of things. One, get the greatest yield out of everything you do. Two, get the greatest joy out of every hour you spend. Three, give the greatest value you can not only render but that can be perceived so you've got the greatest vehicle you're building so it can give you the greatest benefit you and and it deserves that's all uh, you make it makes owning a business sound by contrast <laughs> not like something i would want to run out and do even though i'm currently involved in it what is the victory what is the joy what is the reward that owning your own business gives you and why, and this seems like an inane question after all this discussion, but I'd like to hear you articulate it, why master marketing? Well, first of all, whatever business you're in, you gotta realize two things. You're not selling a business, you're selling a result, you're selling a benefit. Whether you like it or not, you're a sales and marketing company first and foremost. You are currently selling and marketing, whether you do it passively, whether you do it reactively, whether you don't do it, that's what you need. Your, your marketing form, that your, your current preferred way of marketing may be no marketing, but you are a marketing company. See, you got to realize the greatest leverage you've got left in business is the following. I mean, no one's got any great competitive advantage. You can't buy that much cheaper. You can maybe put a second shift on. You can buy a piece of equipment, but by and large, there's no tax advantages. There's no great operational or, or managerial advantages you've got that give you high leverage. Marketing is the only way you've got available that can give you exponential leverage. Basically, most big corporations, big public corporations, they're tickled if they get a 20 or 25 percent ROI every year. Marketing can give you hundreds easily, thousands realistically, tens of thousands frequently of leverage on everything you do. Marketing is the vehicle that gives you distinction. Today in business, the system and business is trying to force everyone to accept being relegated to becoming a commodity. I submit to you, you don't have to succumb. You have the right to become a distinctive, preemptive, proprietary. You can only do that by being a supreme and a master marketer and an agile-minded innovator. Wonderful. Well, tell me something. Why do you do what you do? I, I tend to end these interviews by asking people how they want to be remembered. I think you're going to be around a while, so I don't know if I can ask you that question. <laughs> I mean, you, got, you got some spunk in you. But I, I'd like to know, well, why do you do what you do, and, and how do you want people to think about you or feel about you long term and what you've contributed? The greatest acknowledgement I get is to watch people start smiling, to watch people become happy, to watch people change the way they look at their business, to watch people see their business as a vehicle they can make friends and impact others. That's one reason. Second, Self-servingly, I learn so much from others. I grow exponentially every time I help people because I don't tell, I ask, I learn. So it's a combination. I believe the moment I stop growing, I regress and I atrophy. And um, I don't want to do that. I want to keep growing. And I can't grow if I don't keep helping because when I help, I do it Socratically. And you only learn when you ask questions. That's pretty much it. Well, Jay, I appreciate the time we spent together. We certainly spent more time than we thought originally. And I think you've given people a tremendous number of distinctions or answers, but hopefully what you've done is sparked within them even more questions. Because as you've said, that's the way we're really going to learn, grow, and expand. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed by Tony Robbins and hosted by Anna Yorg. Carrie Song is our executive producer. Tyler Culbertson is our associate producer. Brooks Loro is our digital editor. Special thanks to Diane Adcock and Mary Buckheit for their creative review.